afternoon, my December swans. Welcome to the mega compilation of my five minute reviews, which are normally featured on my Patreon. This is my birthday present to you, except it's my birthday. Well, it's not my birthday today, because my birthday falls on a Saturday this year, it's the 31st of December, which is a big day, and I kind of wanted people to be able to see this and know that it existed, so I'm posting it a few days early. Now, quick introduction, as you can imagine, my five minute reviews are just that. Five minute reviews, typically themes of my choice. Although I actually do listen to suggestions, so feel free to drop any below that you think I should take a look at. These reviews get posted on my Patreon every Tuesday, with occasional bonus reviews on like the odd Saturday here and there. And if you want to see them as they come out, check out my Patreon below. All pledges can see every single five minute review, there's no limits on what you spend versus what you get, everybody can see them. But if you don't want to pledge, that's fine by me. I'll just post them twice a year or so. Anyway, so, some of you will remember that I ran a poll asking you what you would like to see between each five minute review. Whether you wanted to see a comment showcase, a Q&A, nothing, or a little summary of each game with a score out of 10. The results ended up being really close, so I've decided to do a comment showcase and a short summary with a score out of 10. If that's too much for you, feel free to use the chapter select to just go from video to video. I don't mind if you skip my bit, I won't be sad. And since I will not be channeling the same exhausted fear of a belaboured IGN reviewer who is so scared of professional and public backlash that they will give everything a 10 out of 10, I am going to be really subjective. This is going to be very opinion based, but it will be extremely honest. My scale for my ratings will be as follows. If I cannot recommend a game, it will not score above 5 out of 10, which means that a lot of the games you like might score quite low, lower than you expect. It also essentially means that I have two 5 point scales stacked on top of each other, recommend, do not recommend, which for me is just a little bit easier to quantify. And once I've said whether or not I recommend it, we'll say a few things, short summary, and then I'll give you my answer. If you don't agree with my ratings, that's fine. Tell me about your own ratings in the comments below. But if you don't think you can disagree with that insulting me on a personal level, I recommend getting up from your seat, taking a deep breath, going to the bathroom, sticking your head in the toilet for a bit, come back, you know, refreshed and moist. Reassess, and if you still can't get it out without being a massive dickhead, then just close the browser window. It's better for me and it's better for you. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the reviews. If you like them, drop a like and subscribe, and hopefully I will see you in the next video. Hello! Kirsty from the future here. I'm editing and I'm also drunk, which is why my face is so red. Um, it's occurred to me that some of these reviews have slight spoilers in. I never explicitly spoil story beats or endings, but just be aware when you get to a new review each time that there might be spoilers. There's probably not. I can't remember which ones have them in um, and I will not check. I apologise in advance. Um, but yeah, nothing major. Just, just keep an eye out. That's all I'm saying. Keep an eye out. Have a good time. And before we begin, one massive thank you to my patrons for all their support. This literally wouldn't exist without you. And more specifically, a massive thank you to Sam Jones, Julia, and Carissa Fulcher, my highest tiered patrons. I really appreciate the three of you. Thank you so much. I picked up Hades for the first time about a year ago and I just couldn't get into it. And yeah, I know, it makes no sense. The characters are compelling. Our main character, Zagreus, is dry-witted enough to be funny, but not so dry-witted that he becomes one of those characters that drags the mood down at every opportunity, like that annoying bint from Life is Strange Before the Storm. His conflict with his dad is something I'm sure many people with emotionally constipated fathers can understand and relate to, and as you play through the game, you watch his relationships with the entire cast of characters flourish and grow. A lot of the side characters don't get much time to be fully fleshed out either, but I don't really mind since many of them are gods. I like seeing them as the caricatures they absolutely are, especially Zeus who plays the role of the classic smug but loving uncle. The art style is incredible, the 3D models look slick, the use of colour and visual detail means every single character stands out at a glance and every action they take is completely unmistakable. Animations are exaggerated for the sake of having visual clarity. You'll never mistake one movement for another, they are all so diverse and unique that they would never be confused for one another. I think that is so important in an isometric top-down roguelike. The music is really catchy. I know it's Supergiant's classic style and they've been doing it for years, but in my humble, tasteless and ignorant opinion, it has Spyro vibes and so naturally it was something I ended up listening to on Spotify when I wasn't playing the game. Big up Spyro by the way. The gameplay loop is well structured and well defined. Hades' gameplay loop is made up of loosely six stages, the House of Hades, your Harberia, Tartarus, Asphodel and Elysium, which are 
comprised of several procedurally generated stages with random varieties of enemies and loot, the Styx, the final stage, which is one hub area with five available routes, and Greece, where you fight the final boss, your dad, and depending on your progress through the story, catch up with your mum before Zagreus is promptly ripped back down to hell like a moth in a bath. Combat is slick, it's seamless and chill enough to be a game you can wind down with, but it's also challenging, particularly as you lay a difficulty onto it with the heat levels you can unlock after beating a run for the first time. It's something you have to pay attention to and engage with whilst also having smooth and comfortable fun, but for some reason me and Hades just never really clicked. I think it had a lot to do with my own approach to games. As you guys will know, I love trophy hunting, I like playing games as they are. I would never buy a game and play it just for trophies, you know, I still want to be entertained and I still want to have a solid experience, but trophy lists become my to-do list, my measure of how much of the game I have played, of how much of the intended experience I have covered. For those of you that have trophy hunted on Hades, you will know it's a bit of a mess. There are a thousand plates to juggle, boatloads of RNG dialogue to rely on, and some steps of some storylines require poo-poo grind. Take one step into Hades with the intention of sweeping up all those trophies is to just find yourself overwhelmed. It's no fault of the game either, but I'm not simpering enough to say it's a fault of mine. I see speedrunners get a lot of flack for playing games too quickly and not enjoying it. Suck my taint. People have fun in different ways, and mine might be through obsessive and neurotic box sticking, which was unfortunately incompatible with Hades gameplay loop at first. See, about nine months after my initial effort with Hades, I decided to give it another go, and I was hooked. I mean, when I say hooked, I played an hour or two per day, probably five days per week, but for me that's fairly extreme. The gameplay loop consists of runs you take through Hades, so the end of a run is a pretty natural end to stop for the day, which makes it easier to put the game down, I think, but as I began to unlock more prophecies, something given to you randomly, or when certain invisible conditions are met, I was suddenly given a to-do list, and the wheels of Hades rumbled into motion. I really struggle to fault this game, I really do. Everything about it is so massively pieced together, so polished, and yet still with challenge. It does difficulty so well, a system I actually much prefer to the much more renowned Souls series whose difficulty system has really bored me recently. It's a pick your poison system of difficulty where you can increase heat and rewards by adding a series of different constraints to your run. Enemies move faster, have more health, spawn in greater numbers, bosses have adds, etc. The random generation of weapons, boons, powers and loot means every run will be different. You are forced to use every weapon and definitely every kind of power, if not every single power, in the game, which as someone who sticks to what they know more often than not, ended up being seriously welcome for me. It is the only game I have ever played that has flung me out of my comfort zone and I ended up having a really fulfilling time because of it. My main complaint would be the absolute drip feeding of story, usually one or two lines of dialogue per 25 minute run per character, but also also how this can sabotage other side stories. If a main character has story dialogue queued and side story A, B and C dialogues queued, story dialogue takes priority, which is one run, then if you really want to be focusing on side story C, you might need as many as three more runs just to push that storyline by one single step. Then you might arrive and they'll be absent or talking to somebody else, at which point you then need to do another run. Sure, you can do suicide runs, but it feels like a waste of time when there's probably something you can be focusing on in a single run, but still. I found it frustrating, especially with characters like Nyx and Achilles, who are wound up in many side stories and consequently their stories took upwards of 80 or 90 runs to finally get it out of them. The final things I needed for this platinum trophy ended up pushing me over the 80 hour mark. I went into Hades wondering what the fuss was about. I struggled with it for a while, at least until I finished my first successful run, but once I got the ball rolling, once I knew what I was doing, I was sucked in hard. I wouldn't say I loved it, that's a feeling reserved for cheesy garlic pizza bread, but it became an experience I was fully invested in, playing out my strategies for and talking endlessly about with my poor friends. So, you know, I guess it has more in common with cheesy garlic bread than I thought. Starting with Hades, this is a really easy one. Would I recommend this? Yes. Mechanics? Brilliant. Gameplay? Brilliant. Story? Fine. Kind of stringy, but it's exactly what you'd expect from a roguelike. I would honestly give this game an 8 out of 10, which is very positive off the bat, but it's fantastic and it's incredibly accessible. So the first comment on the comment showcase was a comment that read, I am designing a video game specifically for red pill men and that feminists will find hetero patriarchy offensive. But yeah, I'm planning to make it racist, trans and homophobe, misogy and maybe add some hints of pedo bear and some forced coercion in sleeping underscore accommodation 
conversation with a hint of they were asking to it and it was their fault and they were acting, dressing and talking in a provocative way. So this is actually the comment that inspired me to start the My Meanest YouTube Comments channel in my Discord server. It became really apparent to me that a lot of people were dropping in to tell me that as a direct rebuttal to me and my videos they were going to go out of their way to make offensive content just to spite me. Um, I will say that I don't know who you are and should any such game be made, which it obviously won't because only the most unhinged lunatic is actually going to spend hundreds of hours making a game with all of the above to spite a woman they've never met, I probably also won't hear about it because a game like this won't be listed on any platform and will probably just fall into obscurity like that hatred game that no one else has played. So if you are in the comments right now considering it, I recommend you don't waste your time because it probably won't come back to me and if it does I don't think I will be that interested. God, this was a shame. Not a shame with Cuphead, but a shame with me. Yeah, I didn't like this game at all. And no, I didn't do a 180 on it like I did with Hades. Yeah, I know, I'm a fanny. I'm a troglodyte. I'm a mess. My parents are in the process of disowning me for it. I'll see you all on Jeremy Kyle. Cuphead really drew me in. It seemed like my kind of game. Looking at the art style, the animation, the incredible effort put into this title, I was so interested to give it a go. I knew I'd love it. I wanted to fight the adorable mermaid. I wanted to walk around on the overworld and see that little turtle who dips his feet in the water. I wanted to do some 2D platforming fights. Back when games would go into streaming or because chat members would submit them, I bought and added Cuphead to the roster myself. I was that confident that I would love it. So I crack open the game, I load it up, give it a whack, and fucking hell, I couldn't stand it. It's strange, the boss fights weren't bad, the combat was good, the mechanics are sound, unique, memorable, the balancing was neatly done, precise. Everything about this game was fantastic, but it was one thing, and it sounds so minor to even tell you this, but it was one single factor about this game that absolutely turned me off it. The structure. Cuphead is a boss gauntlet. Sure, there's a bit of walking in between, a bit of overworld sightseeing, and occasionally some run and gun missions that are arguably more rage inducing than the boss fights themselves, but it was entirely down to the structure of this game that I burned out on it hard and then walked away. This game is probably 98% boss fights. To pretend there's any other substance to this is to pretend that the gap between your starter and main course, where you're just waiting for food, is a course in and of itself. It's not. It's empty air and you're running out of conversation. See, I like Challenge, I love the Soul series, I rinsed Hades clean on higher heat levels, lovingly sucked on Neo 1 and 2, well into New Game plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, well beyond past when the enemies start to all kill you in one hit, The Last of Us grounded, hilarious fun, Permadeath Outlast, cool if not dangerously close to heart attack territory, but Cuphead? No, god no. What I didn't know about myself going in and what Cuphead graciously helped me learn was that I need an ebb and flow of gameplay, I need smaller stretches in between big moments, that chance to calm down. I need Blight Town between the Gaping Dragon and Keylag. I need a fat walking section between the Clicker Garden and the school. I need those poxy little weird find an item for me quests in Neo between the story missions. I need a change of pace, a chance to unwind, and an opportunity to see a greater breadth of challenge. Put me in front of 30 bosses in a row? No, go away. In the first region of this game, the first aisle, I found myself struggling to find any elation whatsoever from winning fights. The frog the flower, the onion. Not hard bosses at all, but any frustrations I felt during the fight absolutely overshadowed any opportunity I had to feel a sense of victory, especially when another harder fight was waiting just around the corner. I'd slay a beast, it would take me one hour, and then I would find a beast that now took me five hours. Especially in that there's an element of RNG to the fights. Not that all the moves are random, enemies have set movesets and set ads that hop all over the screen, but that these moves can be used in any order and in any combination. In some some fights, the ground you walk on can be random. Sometimes stuff will just push you into a corner and you'll take damage that feels cheap. There's occasionally an eye-rolling amount of visual clutter, tens of items on screen you need to keep an eye on all the time, some of which with some very cheeky hitboxes. Sometimes you'll have a weirdly easy fight where the enemy aggression is low and things are easy to avoid, and it was fights like this that I would typically win, and fights like this I would walk away from with a weird sense of imposter syndrome. I never felt like I was learning this game, even when I learned to parry and time my dodges and pick the best builds, I never felt like I was getting anywhere with Cuphead. More like tripping and falling through it. The dragon, Grim Matchstick from Isle 2, took me a few days of on and off playing before I beat it, and I can't whatsoever remember my response when I beat it. I don't think I had any response at all, it was entirely diminished by the frustration I felt whilst fighting it, and the solemn acceptance that I was likely about to encounter something even worse just around the corner. Like a numb wank, you just grind away at 
hit it with grit teeth and when you finally reach the finish line it's not even worthwhile. I remember my first time beating the Northern Asylum demon on Dark Souls 1, surrounded by my old housemates as they cheered me on. I remember beating Slave Knight Gale to a screaming Twitch chat. I remember beating Fear for the Afterlife on Neo 1, watching the trophy pop and losing my mind, almost crying with pride. But Cuphead? When I look back it's nothing but a blur, probably because of all the tears I was playing it through. I finished the game too, and I've done the DLC. The Salt Baker was hilarious, and the addition of Miss Chalice, the cutest video game character I have ever seen, did kind of help since I found her so adorable and her abilities so useful, I gave this game an honest try with her. I got all the trophies on it too. There were bosses I loved the look of as well, the Ghost Train, the Dogfighters, Satan himself, but there's not one fight on that game that I miss and not one fight I would go back to. Cuphead isn't a game I'm especially proud of finishing. It's a strange situation, I can acknowledge its quality, it's not like I think it's a bad game, I can play it and know that what I am playing is a good, well-made game, but for me, it helped me learn something new about myself. It helped me learn that I don't like Cuphead. So, despite the fact that I absolutely couldn't stand Cuphead, I would recommend it. There are people out there who I think would like it, even if I hated it, and there are people out there that I would recommend it to. I even bought it as a present for my brother, and my brother didn't like it either, but, you know, I... I still, I still would recommend it to people. I thought the mechanics were really good, they were very solid. Some of the areas were a bit bullshit, but one man's bullshit is another man's well-designed, airtight piece of work, and I like Neo, so I love bullshit. I thought the graphics were absolutely perfect, no, no comments there. I thought the story was kind of average, it didn't really hold itself up on its story, but it was still average. And so my final score for Cuphead would be 6 out of 10. So the second comment on our comment showcase read, The pick me girl vibe I get when you review games is almost enough for me to stop watching your review. Sometimes it is interesting to see how you like to be edgy on well received games even though Far Cry 5 was just a mess but all Far Cry games had weird supernatural out of this world vibes hinted in the very real life story concept so of course you don't get it. Just to seem like you don't conform like the rest in the gaming world just for views which I like fucking off conformity in gaming and not liking a game just because it's popular. Although you can be cringe for a woman of your Rage, I still enjoy your wit, plus with the if you don't like it fuck off and see me on Twitter makes it abundantly clear you're a classic edgy gamer pick me girl. I can't decide if you're dull and mediocre or if you're funny and take reasonable digs at certain games that need the criticism, I admire the way you carry your channel. Almost. Also, if you knew the Far Cry 5 storyline, you would understand Faith Seed. Before you review a game with such conviction, you might want to research the storyline which will help you understand mundane things such as Faith's purpose. So obviously this was posted on my Far Cry 5 video, which you might notice I actually really enjoyed as a game, but I just thought the story didn't do enough with the brilliant setup it had, and I think ultimately its fear to say anything of meaning meant it didn't make much of an imprint on gaming culture and got lost in a sea of shooters. So the extra information that this commenter here is referring to, the thing that I don't understand or they claimed I didn't understand, was actually something in a tie-in comic book that referred to the introduction of the character Faith and also in Far Cry 6's DLC they also talk about Faith there and Faith's introduction. Um, I don't think Far Cry 6's DLC was out by the time this comment happened so he was kind of relying on me to have read a tie-in comic book for a game that was not very good. This person seemed to find that to be an edgy take enough to leave this absolute manifesto in my comment section and it took me a little while to realise that I was absolutely being negged. Pick me probably isn't the word I would use to describe myself, but I think it would take a lot of introspection to be able to accept that facet of myself should it exist, so you know, maybe I am a pick me. But it's kind of clear that this guy wanted me to come crawling over to him, apologising, begging for his approval, which naturally it wasn't going to happen. I never played a game I felt I could describe as Oscar bait until I played Gris, or Grease. I guess it's French, but I'm English, so I'm gonna butcher it and call it Grease. Don't get me wrong, Grease is fine. It's serviceable. Grease is a simple 2D platforming game, taking you through several major levels, each with their own colour and theme. The themes being stages of grief, represented throughout the game. A few of them, anyway. There's a lot of debate on whether there are five or seven stages of grief, and I guess Grease subscribes to there being five. It's probably less effort to make a 
game with five instead of seven chapters anyway, so you go. Mechanically, Greece is not super complex. There's no combat, and although there are puzzles, they're very simple. There are no fail states and no death states. Most puzzles involve a little bit of platforming and a few simple button presses. Even when facing hostile enemies, they will just nip you on the arse like an excitable Jack Russell, causing you to burst forward out of reach again. And that's cool. It's clearly a game that wants to be a relaxing experience, and having their player ripping their hair out with frustration isn't how you do that. Like Bug Snacks, and if anything, more games should be like Bug Snacks. Grace is a quiet game, one you work through slowly and then, if you're like me, several more times to get all the trophies you've missed because you keep accidentally missing one single collectible and having to restart the entire chapter it's in again. Literally one fucking apple sat up on a shelf that can be missed if you accidentally walk slightly too far to the left. It had me restarting the level I think at least three times, and it's not near the start of the level either. I was probably playing like 10 minutes at least per attempt, only to reach the apple and then immediately miss it again. Each level has its own thing, like a gimmick. Be that a little friend that you lead to and from said apples, an eel that chases you and scares the shit out of you every time it randomly bursts through walls, gusts of wind that send you flying backwards every few seconds, momentum based diving and gravity puzzles. They build throughout the levels too, weaving in fun mechanics that build on each other to feel developed and complex, but don't overstay their welcome. There's also a series of collectibles called mementos. Mementos are little blinks of light that you can find tucked away all around the levels. None of them are stupidly hidden. They're all findable with a bit of exploration, and collecting all of them will earn you access to a hidden ending, which is a nice incentive to go the extra mile for. The game is even nice enough to tell you which ones you are missing in which order they are missing, which is more than most games will do. See, it's a good game and an easy way to burn a few hours. I think all in all it took me about six hours, with the replays maybe eight, maybe less, but like I say, I'm a dumbass. I did need to do more restarts than a normal player would need to, just to get that fucking apple. It's good. But it, of all the games I have ever played, reached so hard for Oscar bait that it strained its lats. I have never seen a game try so hard to be deep and meaningful, whilst actually, in my opinion, doing so little to feel deep and meaningful. When playing this on stream, a few members of chat verbalised the shallowness of the on-screen metaphors, particularly the depression level, which sees you in a tranquil, beautiful cave full of gushing waterfalls, sparkling ponds, and incredible underwater architecture. Being that this depression level is supposed to represent the depression stage of grief, you know, bearing in mind what we are referring to here is the more temporary state of depression that one works through after a bereavement or breakup, rather than the more permanent, medically diagnosed depression, I found the metaphor to be a bit romantic and a bit beautiful. I've had a few family members die in my time, I've lost a few pets, I pre-ordered Cyberpunk 2077, I've endured a few breakups, so yeah, I've not undergone the extremes of grief, but I've had plenty to deal with, and I found this metaphor for depression to be a bit prettified. Not so much a polished turd, as it is just a printed out drawing of a cartoon turd with anime eyes, if you get my metaphor. Not even a whiff of the real thing, more a strange, heavily, heavily translated, heavily sanitised version of the real thing, until it's basically entirely different, to the point where the meaning of the original is lost. The poopy. Chat and I had a pretty long conversation about how depression is probably the worst stage of grief, usually the one that lingers the longest, the one that you have to make room in your life to accommodate, keeps you up at night. So we considered alternatives. Personally, depression for me would be a series of horrible, miserable swamps to trudge through. Every time you think you've reached the end, there's just a little bit more to get through, and you're only allowed to eat garden peas. Gross. The bargaining stage, feeding an apple to an apple friend, was also one I didn't find particularly resonant. It just felt like my character was making friends with a little woodland creature and building a friendship, whereas bargaining tends to be more like, I wish I did things differently, if only I tried this instead, why didn't I cancel the pre-order? It's fruitless pining for an alternative course of events and feeding this fruitless pining by giving it time and validation and allowing yourself to dwell on it only makes it worse, not better. I felt as though the designers came up with each level first, made some sound and fun gameplay ideas, put some solid mechanics into these levels, made a genuine genuinely enjoyable game, honestly, a pretty fun solo experience, but then decided afterwards, oh this one's red so we'll make it anger, oh this one's got water in it so we'll make it depression, cause you cry water. We'll make this one acceptance, with some okay parallels, some surface level visual parallels, but with some of the loosest mechanical similarities I've ever seen. Sure, art is in the eye of the beholder, sure it's all down to personal perspective and your own interpretation, but this is my review, and it wasn't anything that resonated with me whatsoever 
however personally. Even on replays, working through this game to find the collectibles and the miscellaneous achievements I missed, I worked through this game again and really paid attention to it, but I never quite felt it speak to me. I never quite picked up what Greece was putting down. Maybe Greece was an extremely personal project for a certain someone. Maybe it was a collective collaboration that drew upon multiple stories from multiple people, like a big sad cauldron. Maybe it was an early edition weaved into the game from the start. Maybe it was a late edition slapped in because the game wouldn't have much going for it without. Maybe it was just a bit of let's make the levels represent stages of grief because that's an easy metaphor to do. Whatever. You know what? At least it's not the seven deadly sins or a deck of tarot cards. I can count my overused blessings there at least. So a lot of people were really touched by Greece or Gree. Oh, I still don't know how to say it. I, I still don't see what people see in it. You know, I, I've given it thought since I made that review and I still just don't get it. Would I recommend it? Probably not. The mechanics were fine, if not very two-dimensional and very basic. Uh, the graphics were brilliant, they were absolutely incredible, and the story was, to me, very basic, like extremely basic, and it didn't work with me in any way, I didn't find anything I was particularly inspired by, it didn't resonate with me, so I, I would probably give this game a 4 out of 10. So this is a comment I would describe as brain dead, but to read it, this commenter said you use 10 minutes to describe a book, then two minutes to analyze a letter. To break it down and analyses all in every sentence, you remind me of the English teacher who asks why did the author describe the curtains as blue? Like shut the fuck up, I'm literally on minute 15 and dying on this draining video. You should have just wrote a blog sheesh or an essay. Some absolutely fantastic person replied cry about it, which I was in love with, thank you very much, thank you to you. Uh, but secondly, I love being told to write an essay in the comment section of my video essays. I don't know what this commenter expected but they definitely need to refine their keyword search next time. Thirdly, anti-intellectualism is a plague and I'm not going to labour a point that's futile to make when this is the kind of attitude that I'm up against. I used to think why are the curtains blue is boring rhetoric as well but then I grew up and I realised that literature doesn't happen in a vacuum and how authors try to convey tone is actually really interesting. If you were writing and you wanted to say show a sad character and make the atmosphere feel sad, which descriptive words would you use to set the tone? You see it a lot in like politics news, uh, for example in the UK, one political leader might talk to the press and you'll watch the interview and they'll just be like talking back and forth with the reporter, but then you'll read the written report and it would be like, this politician lambasted the reporter, they snarled, and it's like, these words don't just come out of nowhere, when we use these kinds of words, there's a reason. You can love stuff at face value, but you can also appreciate that things have depth and origin and things were understanding. Like, I mean, I'd watch a Michael Bay film. No, actually, I'm lying. I wouldn't. But I love rice. That doesn't mean that I can't have a palate. As the curtain closes on an era of gaming history, and I had to scramble to get my last few trophies in before the servers presumably closed forever, I thought I'd smack a quick review together to reflect on my favourite way to get told to kill myself. Now, as far as the life cycle of Overwatch goes, I hopped onto the train pretty late, within a year of Overwatch 2's release. By the time I finally showed my face on the scene, the game was apparently dead, despite the fact that I could queue and comfortably find a game within 10 seconds, rather than getting the beautiful Dead by Daylight killer queues I used to be blessed with that I could leave running during work meetings, showers, and a quick hoover of my flat because they would be about 30 minutes each. So Overwatch matches consist of two teams of six with three roles, two of each. DPS, tank, and support, with a pretty wide variety of characters per role, and a truckload of pawn associated with each of them, to the point where the pawn scene is definitely more thriving than the comp one, but as Pumba reminds us, Hakuna Matata, that is just how shit is. The standard product life cycle made manifest. See what they did to Clippy. I enjoy playing tank the most because it gives me the freedom to run around like a moron without really putting myself at risk. Tanks have loads of health and they're also there to create space and lead their team towards the objective, spreading the enemy team thin and preventing bottlenecks. Depending on which tank you play, you're also expected to be a little bit more defensive or a little bit more gun-ho. An Orissa on attack is a pleasant massacre to watch, a cowardly Reinhardt can lose a game and get flamed accordingly. But that expectation of initiative also means people are likely to confuse you with someone who might be leading the charge and consequently leading the team, so like a nervous groom on his wedding night you have to be fully prepared to disappoint a lot of people before you hop into that queue. Tanks have a safety net because it's hard for you to do badly with them. I mean when you do bad you do bad, but by and large you can drop in with a reasonable expectation of success. Unless you're D.Va you'll probably never make MVP, because D.Va's always get MVP, so in exchange for having low stakes you also get lower social rewards. 
reward. Playing tank is a thankless job. Tankless. Then we have DPS, a category I was terrified to touch for a long time. The best thing about playing DPS is coming to the realisation that no one is good at DPS. Everyone is shit at DPS. If you're good at DPS, you're a smurf. And when you're bad at DPS, you need to take precious time out of the match to drop into team chat to slag off your own team. An Arissa on attack? Asked a Cassidy. I could have sworn was doing a pacifist run of Junkertown. You're throwing the game, he insisted, having less kills than everybody else on the team. I watched him get interrupted out of his ult by a Genji, who bitch slapped him so hard he seemed to suspiciously disconnect from the game itself. Hmm. Everyone knows how you are supposed to play DPS. You walk in, get smacked around, maybe fire off a few kills in the process, but ultimately your character is made of paper mache and you better have your DMs closed because someone is going to drop in to prescribe you some self-harm to treat the inevitable knox to your ego. I hate playing DPS. Even on quick play classic it's just too much pressure. Unless you're playing Reaper, in which case doing an adorable spinny teleport around the map is so much fun that I better be sure I'm on mute or my teammates will hear me going wee as I accidentally spin right into a rabid junk rat. Support is the final role, and definitely the one that gets the most women, and men. But be warned, appearances are deceiving. They might come across like a hub of tranquility, the bottoms of the gaming world, but there's nothing more terrifying than a furious, toxic mercy. Never ever have I had more people in game chat telling me to throw myself into the Thames because I decided to try out Soldier 76 for the first time in a casual quick play match than I have an angel skin mercy. Woman, I'm trying to figure out how to use sprint. I'm figuring out which button the spit roast command is on. Stop flapping around my head, you big blonde housefly. No, I will not join a PSN party with you. No, my mother's maiden name is not Green. Why do you ask? Yes, that is my address in team chat. Why are you telling me that? I already know what it is. The best thing about playing support is, converse to the suspiciously low-key life of a tank player, is that you are much more risk and reward. Your DPS spend the entire game picking their nose, get three kills between them, and get out damaged by a hamster, Support issue. Shit support. Not healing me. Yeah, well, Ash, I can't heal you when you and your 30 HP split off from the entire team for a sightseeing tour of King's Row. Sorry you felt the need to tell me to end my life because you walked backwards towards a roadhog with your trousers around your ankles. You are a lost cause, but yeah, sure, it's because I didn't heal you. And that's often where I found a lot of my frustrations with the game. Never having an opportunity to learn, grow, and try new things without learning the existence of 50 slurs I never knew existed. Kitty underscore snow underscore xx wanted to play Mercy, but I've picked Mercy, and now there's a red dot on my forehead and a DM full of the most foulest, inhuman shit I've ever seen uttered by someone who brands themselves on being soft. What's difficult about the game is that there's never somewhere you can be reasonably expected to practice. DPS characters, as I've previously implied, can be very tricky. I'm a console player too, so coming up to the plate with characters like Widowmaker and Hanzo was DM suicide. Even in casual and quick play matches, people treat you like you're trying to pass the collective fucking bar exam. You'll get harassed for your choice your plays, your approach, how and when you ult, which moves you use, who you heal and boost, and the game mode's designed to be the place where you get that practice and try something new. After a while there were just some characters, mainly DPS, that I never did touch, because the gravity of doing something wrong with a brand new character when surrounded by these absolute blights of humanity meant I was always at arm's length from getting doxxed by an irate May or a Farrah that won't stop dropping slurs in team chat, and it is always Farrah dropping slurs. I can't possibly recommend Overwatch, not because of the game play all the characters, not because I got called the F slur literally the moment I got the platinum trophy, but because by the time this video is out, Overwatch will be no more. Overwatch 2 will have materialised much to the disappointment of many who don't seem particularly excited for it, and that's fine by me. I will watch from a distance with my DMs firmly closed. Overwatch 2 is a really difficult one because it is trash and with all the changes made to Overwatch 2 and the fact that this was definitely pushed out early, I think, in my opinion, to combat some of the bad blood they were getting, deservedly, because of all the sexual assault that was happening, Overwatch 2 is kind of half-baked. It's had a lot of features stripped out and not very well. For example, you can still invite people through PSN to play with you and it still says that the party size is out of six because in Overwatch 1 you had a six person party, in Overwatch 2 you have a five person party. The characters still have their on fire voice lines even though the on fire feature doesn't exist anymore. It's definitely like a gutted husk of Overwatch 1 with some quality of life changes and that awful battle pass and I lost all of my customization options when I merged my character with Overwatch 2 and Blizzard support would not help me and they ignored all of my messages which means that if I want to get the trophy for getting 50 cosmetics I can either play for approximately five years was the assumed time it would take to do it without paying any money or I could buy the battle pass and I just oh blizzard
Oh, okay. Um, would I recommend it? Yeah, I would. But only if you were only if you were gonna play with a squad. I could not imagine solo queuing into this game. The mechanics are good. The graphics are fine. They're kind of cartoony enough that they don't particularly age. You know, like Borderlands graphics. It's quite ageless. You know, it. You don't see it age so fast. The online scene is harsh. I've been told to kill myself a lot. The moment I got the platinum trophy, somebody called me the F slur because I had comboed with the Zarya on my team and used Torbs. You know, it doesn't matter. My final score for this would be six out of ten. So this is another kind of comment that I get really commonly, but let's talk about it. So this commenter said, I bet if the genders were reversed, you would love this game, hypocrite. I said, nice rebuttal, skid. And they said, at least you are honest about your hatred for men. So these are the kinds of hypotheticals that get thrown at me a lot that are wrong, but I also just can't reasonably argue against them. What this commenter here is relying on is the absence of evidence, both for and against his case. Sure, he can't prove what he's saying, but I can't prove it's false, and that's what these kinds of hypotheticals predicate on. For the record, I can only speculate as to the inner machinations of creepy older men, but as a woman, I can put myself in an older woman's shoes and be like, why the fuck are you wearing these shoes? More specifically, what I'm trying to say is women who groom young boys are fucking disgusting. Just the example in the video that I was talking about was a man, and I'm not gonna waste my time soothing egos every video by going, but I would be just as upset if it was a man for the record, trying to be all even and making sure some random bloke doesn't feel called out, because that would be a fucking pick me thing to do. And maybe there's a reason this commenter feels called out. I would argue older men are far more hypocritical regarding stuff like this. Like, they would batter any guy that assaulted their daughter, but their son gets groomed by an older woman and they'll just be like, oh, where was she when I was at school? This is one of the many reasons why I absolutely hate hypothetical questions. And yeah, you know, ironically, I have been a bit of a hypocrite and I occasionally do use hypotheticals in my work, but it like, if you say to me, oh, but if this completely unrelated thing happened, you'd be really upset. I just, I won't engage with it. Like, you can't prove it and I can't prove it so there's no point talking about it. Happy Halloween, fellow kids! Outlast is a game that walked in the shoes of Amnesia the Dark Descent, taking what made that game a standout, breathing new life into survival horror, and refined it. No inventory, no light source, rooms full of fucked up shit, hiding behind bookshelves from some of the most messed up entities I've seen since I attended the yearly Shapiro inbreeding festival. Outlast is a very scary game. Sure, nowadays the enemies look a bit goofy, a bit old graphics-y, a bit like Play-Doh, and that might take some of the edge off if you picked up the game for the first time now, but back in the day, as in like five years ago, this was cutting edge horror. I played it when it came out, huddled around my housemate's computer, squealing at every jump scare, and I replayed it again several years later. It's mad that you can easily sprint through this in an hour when your first playthrough, if you're anything like me, will see the rise and fall of empires before you ever reach the final cutscene. Not a controversial take, I don't think, but Outlast is essentially a walking simulator. A term often associated with a low quality game riding solely on story, but I promise I don't mean it in a shitty way. You have no inventory, there's no combat, that, no real puzzles. All you have is a video camera with night vision and you occasionally have to turn valves or press buttons. Your job is to walk from one end of the game to the other end of the game. It's like one of those haunted house horror attractions at fairgrounds. You walk in, there's a single perfectly linear route through the house, and actors jump out at you and scream and sometimes grab you. My mum actually smacked one of those actors once out of fright and she was escorted out of the haunted cornfield. I was too young to go in and consequently I did not get to bear witness to such a momentous occasion. So 75% at least of this game is very, very heavily scripted. Doors with dead zones stop you from seeing the scripted jump scare that comes barreling into your face as soon as you pass the threshold. Abandoned trolleys force hallways to get thinner so you can't see the cued NPC on the other side with the funny face. The church cutscene is so long that on later runs it was my opportunity to use the toilet. The other 25% of this game consists of chasers and or patrolling enemies. Usually a patrolling enemy that will likely become a chase and one you need to use the environment to very carefully avoid. But once you are familiar with the structure of this game, the reality of its linearity is completely laid bare. Did that sound cool? I hope so. Especially the DLC, which is essentially one straight corridor that stops you every 20 minutes for a mandatory chase. I think it has only three or four actual moments you can die, and yet it's almost longer than the main game. And there's definitely only one single moment, even on insane difficulty, where you have to actually hide until a patrolling enemy walks by long enough that you can then run. Whistleblower is cool, and I did enjoy it, but for a DLC that's about physically one third the length of the main game, it takes almost as long to play it in its entirety because of all the bloat 
bloated, unskippable cutscenes you are forced to sit through every single time. Honestly, I think most people will only play this game one single time. A lot of people won't even finish this game, and I think that's very fair. Horror games kind of have their own rung of judgement to me. They serve to provide a thrill for players, and if you play it and you get a thrill, then in my opinion that's quite valid. It is done when it's set out to do. There's no combat to learn, no complex systems to experiment with, no alternative endings. This game is very well furnished for one single playthrough. However, as a neurotic trophy hunter, I did several. When I returned to Outlast after all those years, I did a collectible run, I did a run on the hardest difficulty, and I did a run on the hardest permadeath difficulty. Several runs, in fact. The Insanity run, because I kept dying. And my fucking god, was it hard. There is one section in the Insanity run that I practiced several times on Nightmare and just could not figure out how to do it. Called the Female Ward, there are three fuses you have to find with a roaming enemy that can sniff you out no matter where you are, how quietly you're moving, or what you're doing. The harder the difficulty, the smarter and faster the enemy is, and the less hits you can take. I think that guy could hit me two or three times before I died, but the problem wasn't the damage, it was the fact that I could be three rooms away, crouched behind a row of lockers, not moving, and I would hear him scream like a triggered Oblivion NPC and come flying in to beat my shit. So I ended up using a weird glitch to skip the entire section completely. However, on my permadeath run, I found out that if you run during the weird glitch, the map you're trying to get to doesn't load in time and you fall to your death, so you have to take it very slowly. It's strange, with the length of the game and the precision of the encounters, there was a part of me that thought, yeah, this is how this game is meant to be played. But I also scared the shit out of my Twitch chat because from the roughly 40 minute mark, I heard heart palpitations so intense and so painful that my body was like jolting with the force of them. Apparently my symptoms were worryingly close to that of a heart attack. I'm 20 fucking six, my dudes, and I almost got taken out by a horror walking simulator. Leave that out of the eulogy, tell them I saved orphans. I think your most fulfilling experience with Outlast is, like many other games, going to be your first playthrough. The issue with replaying Outlast over and over and over again, like I did, is that you start to become very aware of how much an on-rails scenario this whole game is. Sure, it's a very scary game with, for a horror franchise, a surprisingly deep and well-considered story with lots to read about, lots of foreshadowing and internal reference, and lots of extra details you'll notice on later playthroughs, but the gameplay itself is as simple as it can get. So next we have Outlast. Outlast is like the go-to horror game besides Amnesia. So would I recommend it? Yes. The mechanics are okay. Like, it's it's a walking simulator. You can't really do anything besides pull levers and press buttons, but on a surface level, what it achieves is fantastic. The mechanics are fine. The graphics are fine. I revisited it. Everybody looks like Play-Doh, but weirdly it didn't impact my situation that much. The story's good and also there's a lot of fleshing out in like notes and extra little bits and pieces of understanding that you can like find around the, the story path. So there's there's a lot to dig into and there's a lot of stuff that you can read and it really does build upon itself really well. My final score for this would be 7 out of 10. I thought it was thought it was fine. So this is one of my favourite comments of all time and this comment just read, you're a female. I didn't know whether or not this was an accusation, a concern, an observation or what, but yes, it is true um, and thank you. We're trudging back to our roots today kids, and when I say roots, I mean as in the skeleton we all have within us screaming for freedom, trapped within the confines of our skin suits. Except wholesome. Where the Water Tastes Like Wine is one of those games with such a fucking long and arduous name that it's so difficult to casually tell friends about, and nothing that can be effectively acronymed. Wur Wur Tur Wur offers no insight, and Water and Wine is property of that whole Jesus fandom already, so by the time I'd shuffled through this experience, I was just referring to it as the skeleton game. Anyway. The Skeleton Game is a game I, in my graphic spoilt nature, wasn't initially too taken by. You, what looks like a plasticine skeleton with all the polygons of a PlayStation 1 microwave, spawn on a map of the United States. It's not to scale, obviously, or this game would be about 50 years long, but it's more like a big map with some little houses and some tiny mountains and some rivers. The aim of this game is simple, you need to collect stories. Around the map you'll find little icons with small images, and when you interact with them, the locals will let you in on a bit of gossip, and when you reach a bonfire, you will find one of several characters you can actually tell these stories to. Stories are categorised, and if you tell them stories from the correct category, you'll push their own stories along, creating more stories. But that's not all. Tell them the story and walk back out into the world, and you might find new versions of the story you've told. You tell Herman that the butcher's wife got fingered around the back of the bike bins, and the next thing you know you're hearing a story about the wailing nun of the bike bins. And the next time you hear it, the bike bin is a monastery, and they've accidentally written the nun. This has an adverse effect, where occasionally, 
the category a story is in isn't fully clear until the story has already been told. You might hear about a dog that can tell if its owner is going to have an epileptic fit, and you're like, oh, that's a hopeful story, or maybe an adventurous story or something. But then it's assigned as horror, and you don't realise until you're five retellings deep, and all of a sudden the dog steals the souls of epileptics and uses them to fill a massive bounty castle. All in all, this game isn't about one big story, but about watching a country of stories grow and develop around you. A lot of the stories are retellings of real myths and legends of America. A lot of the characters are based on the various cryptids and spirits from American folklore as well, representing the native population, the immigrant white population, and the oppressed black population. It doesn't shy away from representing slavery, racism, and whatsoever else was just crammed into those early days of the United States history with a bold-faced honesty, like a smorgasbord of systematic oppression. You have fairly minor choices to make within the small stories and encounters you find along your journey, but nothing ever has a long-standing effect of any kind on you. Usually choices will just result in different readings of stories, or maybe you'll lose health if you make a choice that results in poo-poo consequences, but there's no overarching plot here, just experiences. That being said, you can die in this game, and it's very arbitrary. Your character has tiredness, money, and health in this game. If you lose all of your health, you die. If you get tired and don't rest, you die. You can earn money by engaging in little encounters you see around the map, but these encounters dry up and maybe they respawn or maybe they don't, but by the time I finished as many of the stories as I could, I was walking until I got tired, dying, reloading, and repeating, since I couldn't afford to buy food or energy items from cities and I couldn't find any random events. Spoiler alert, but when you've finished the game and are accessing the free roam mode after the fact to do any cleanup, using the bonfires you've been using for energy all this time now force you to end the game and you have to reload from the title screen. There's not really any gameplay challenge that comes with dying besides dropping you on your last checkpoint and smacking you on the bum, so I'm not sure why they included it. The death screen shows you a timeline of all the stories you've encountered, so maybe it was initially intended to be permadeath and force you to restart right from the beginning, but otherwise I've got no clue. Personally, I'm glad it wasn't permadeath, even though this is a hypothetical I've completely invented within my own mind like a Twitter straw man argument, because the walking speed is so slow in this game that it takes ages to get anywhere. I swear you walk in dog years on this, and it's not too bad on your first go around when you're meeting everyone and picking up the bulk of your stories, but when I got down to the last 30 or so stories, walking for 10-20 minutes at a time, it really drags. You can tap R1 to toggle walking on so you're always walking, but you still need to keep an eye on the screen as your character will get stuck on every bit of the environment. You can't just leave them to figure their way out, they're like a toddler, they need constant supervision. You can walk faster if you whistle, but as the game wears on you start to become abundantly aware that your character only whistles two or three different tunes, and the background music, despite being different per region, also runs thin fast so it doesn't entirely help. You can also hitchhike, sticking your thumb out at approaching cars, but sometimes the cars will just drive past, and often I would reach my destination whilst waiting for somebody to pick me up. Still, as a single experience, lovingly crafted into something just shy of ten hours, it was nice and it was worthwhile. As much as I was getting agitated towards the end with the walking speed, despite being able to teleport with some items you earn from in-game characters, the second the final trophy popped, I already missed this game again. And you can be a skeleton with a stick and bindle, so five stars. Will a Water Taste Like Wine is a really interesting one. I would recommend this game, purely off the back of the fact that it is so unique. It is a really unique, solid experience. It's only about seven hours. It's one of those games that you could, in my opinion, not sink two weeks into. It's a one-time play, one-time experience kind of thing. But I don't think that limits it. I think it just means that people are less likely to want to spend on it when they can get more bang for their buck somewhere else. But the mechanics are good besides the walking speed, which will absolutely cripple the tail end of a playthrough if you're trying to see as much as you can. The graphics are alright, the art is incredible, whereas the overworld I think stylistically is okay but probably could have done with a little bit more development. The story all kind of what you'd consider the story to be was it, was, it was really interesting, I really liked it. I'd probably give this one, it might be the beard talking but I'd give this one an 8. So this comment was brilliant. So this comment first quoted me. Uh, I said, This video has been a baptism by fire in terms of keeping my language respectful and inclusive. I promise I will be carrying it with me to the next video. And this complete bastion of sensitivity responded, And with that, this is the first and last video of yours I will watch. When you cave to the mob, you've sacrificed your integrity. All thoughts and words must now be run by the thought police for what is acceptable, lest we hurt the feelings of a selective 
view. If you slip up now, prepare to be raked over the coals for the smallest transgression. This is the audience you are creating, and I pity you. I love this because this guy dropped into a video, saw that I was taking on feedback well and constructively, and went, you're not the person you were five minutes ago. You sold out. The idea that I could be learning from my mistakes and not literally using incorrect words when describing disabilities and the like was for some reason so repulsive to this person that they had to voice their thoughts and say goodbye was kind of tragic. Like, I literally misused the word neurodivergent because I was confused about it and ended up using it in an entirely wrong situation. People pointed it out to me, I said thank you, and this man reached out to tell me that he pities me. Ongoing critique is healthy and I take it well. I get a lot of ongoing critique. I do not get dragged over the coals. If I make a mistake, people are usually really cool about it. Unless you're the kind of person who drops in to tell me to be more objective and less biased in my videos. I roll my eyes so hard at that bollocks. If you're one of those saps, go read a Wikipedia article. Because that usually just translates to, our opinions aren't the same and I want you to change yours. Not to be a negative Nancy, but the moment I saw this game advertised, I could tell it just wasn't going to be my thing. The main selling point of a game being the absolute most basic kind of appeal you can imagine in a piece of media, you can be a cat. Okay, sure. And the rest? These kinds of purely visual gimmicks aren't things that especially gel well with me, and yeah, it seemed to be some kind of linear puzzle platformer where most of the puzzles are absurdly simple, i.e. find an item to swap for another item, or stealth based, sneak past the thing that has lights on the front so you can see where it's looking, or platformer based, find the simple parkour route from here to there. Since there are thousands of these kinds of games out, and done to varying degrees of success, I decided to save myself some time and give this one a swerve. Maybe focus on beating my head against The Last of Us multiplayer, or screaming into the void of Returnal, or just sitting in the corner of the room and drawing trophy roadmaps on the wall in my own blood. Either way, I was happy to let this one pass me by, and then it got voted in for my monthly video game club, so I had to play it. Fantastic, I thought, loading up this completely free game. This is literally 1984. Now, I'll acknowledge that my initial bias would undoubtedly affect my experience with Stray, but I've had my mind changed so many times before. I thought I would hate Crash Bandicoot, and I ended up loving it so much that I 100%ed the entire series, plus Crash Team Racing. I definitely didn't think I'd like Dead by Daylight, and I'm sitting at well over a thousand hours on it now, and maybe I do like it, I'm not quite sure yet. And I thought Madison would be so shit that I could make a controversial video about it, and I ended up recommending it to everyone who would listen to me, which was like two people. So yeah, I wasn't fussed on Stray, but that's not to say my mind wasn't open to change. Unfortunately, however, my mind was not changed. See, you don't play as a cat in Stray, you play as a small orange man. Now the platforming and the mannerisms and the gameplay, very cattish, very nice, we can call it cat forming if you like, but I think around chapter 3 or 4, just when you start to encounter other sentient beings, you find a little drone that sits on your back and can talk to every every other robot for you and have them talk back to you, and this drone can also translate writing for you so that you can technically read anything you find, which now just bridges the gap between you as a cat and you as a person. Because considering a player of human sentience is piloting a cat, the only real thing keeping you at bay was an ability to communicate back and forth, and that has now been completely removed. You are now just a tiny naked orange bloke who walks on all fours. Stray isn't a long game, I think you can easily get through it in 4 hours on a first playthrough and less than two hours in any playthrough beyond. It's extremely linear, to the point where you can only jump to platforms if you can see an X on them. In linear chapters I felt like I was basically on rails. In open world sections I spent half the time trying to finagle my cat onto the right ledge, it was just needlessly fiddly. Sure yeah, cats can jump really high and it would be hard I suppose to just let a player do as they wish, but I would spend so much time trying to wriggle myself into the angle required where the game would finally let me jump to the platform I wanted to jump to without focusing on all the other platforms to the left, right, above and below of me. It just it felt asinine. In a game where I think UX was a key focus, it ended up frustrating me so much on a lot of very fundamental levels. I missed a collectible that required me to jump to a pipe because I tried for a while to see if I could jump to the pipe and I just didn't get the magic angle needed to make the X show up and I just assumed that I couldn't go there despite it being one foot away from my position. Not only that, but anything you can interact with would show a bright white button, but if you can't interact with it, the button is greyed 
played out with no explanation. Weirdly, I found this even more irritating than if they'd showed no possible interaction at all. One section of the game saw me in a three-tier village and I wanted to pick up a flower I found around the base of the village, but it just wouldn't let me. It turns out I needed to progress the story very slightly and then come all the way back as my drone was in a sad mood about something and they didn't want to help me. I'd just rather have no option to try and pick it up if it's not going to let me. Don't show me the interactable button with no explanation as to why I can't use it. I was shuffling around for ages trying to get the right angle or seeing if I had any dialogue options or any nearby conflict going on. It ended up being laughably annoying. I really enjoy linear games at the moment. I really need that steer, especially when streaming, so that I can speak to chat while not needing to constantly figure out what I'm doing next. I really enjoy short experiences that need multiple playthroughs and yet Stray just didn't do it for me. It was a game I found so overwhelmingly boring. There was nothing whatsoever that stood out to me with this. The story was bland. The emotional moments just didn't hit me at all. The city design was very awesome. It was very cool, but we spent so much time in tunnels and sewers and grey factories that I didn't get much of an opportunity to enjoy the rich set design at all. Even as a cat person with a beautiful little chubby baby called Yusefka constantly following me around and purring all the time, the allure of allowing me to play as a cat just didn't appeal. It's somebody else's cat. If I could have modded the cat to look like my cat, I probably would have been super invested, but this was just some weird, slightly creepy looking glazed eye little cat that padded around and never really did anything. But hey, at least it was free. First things first, I would not recommend Stray. I thought that it was fine. Like, it was literally fine. You know, it's one of those things where you could play that, which I consider to be thoroughly average, or you can play something better. You know, if you get home from an evening worth of work, one of the last games I'm gonna recommend to you is Stray. I just, I thought it was literally fine, but you can, there's, there's so much out there that you can have a better time with that I would recommend. The mechanics were below average. It felt very linear. Even in the open world areas, because of the fact that you have to press X to jump to ledges, it felt like just a linear thingy of quick time events, even though it wasn't. Because obviously I don't imagine that you can account for all the different heights a cat can jump to. It's not, it's not really probable, but it felt really sparse. The story was all right. Three out of ten, right? Ah, uh, so these two comments came as a pair, one minute apart from each other, and they were fantastic. So the first comment chronologically read, Looks good. I'm going to download it now. It looks to be just my type of game. Appreciate the recommendation. And the second one a minute later said, We need more games like this. Both of the comments had been liked by them. They liked their own comment. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Um, but this is another comment type that I get just so fucking often. The kind of commenter that buys a game I dislike out of spite and then tells me about it, presumably to get a reaction from me. Bit of context. When I played The Suicide of Rachel Foster, it was because I thought it would be a cool murder mystery and I was disappointed, so I took my experience with it and I made a review about it. But I've never in my life spent however much money this game retails for, I can't even remember now, just to try and have a go at upsetting somebody on the internet who I've never met and never will meet. I get accused of being a triggered snowflake so many times in my comment sections, but I can't think of anything more emblematic of being triggered when somebody goes out of their way to buy and play a game just to fight the woke Twitterati and then make some like unhinged comment to tell me that they have played it. Especially when they pick the game up and presumably find it is as boring as I warned them it would be. Like, you do you fellow, but I won't remember you. My review of The Last of Us Part 2 has been a very significant and prominent mole sitting right on the face of my YouTube channel for a long time now. It's no secret that I find that game irredeemably bad, but so often in the comments, and when I say so often I mean like three times, I've been asked when I will make a review on Part 1. And the thing is, I don't really see the point in making a review on Part 1. It's just good, isn't it? Like, what else is there to say? I say this in my Last of Us 2 review, and there's no real need to plug that here, since if you're a patron I imagine you've already seen that, but my my only issue with part one is the ending, which takes a very natural, authentic and grounded story and suddenly puts you in the silliest, most arm-twisty, manipulative situation. The perfect domino effect of events forcing you into a situation whereby you are truly in the greyest of grey areas, forced to resort to mass murdering violence but without being the bad guy. Twisting a situation like that into shape takes a lot of elbow grease. Ellie got taken for surgery while Joel was unconscious? Check. Joel isn't allowed to say goodbye and check that Ellie consents to it? Check. Ellie doesn't 
sign any waiver or leave Joel a note to say she's okay with it? Check. They act like a dick to Joel and try to kick him out and threaten to shoot him? Check. We're told very definitively afterwards that it probably wouldn't have worked? Check. Yeah, a consent form would have probably gone a long way with this game. You could argue Joel would have gone nuts even if Ellie had given her explicit consent, and I didn't initially think that, but I would say I believe you now, it's probably true, but then Joel would be in the wrong. So, so easy how that pendulum can swing. Everyone's looking for that meaning behind the standing shoe in Nope. Turns out it represents Joel sitting very carefully right on the line between good and bad. See, I knew Jordan Peele would find a way to put a Last of Us reference into his new film. I mean, until that absolutely paper-thin facade of an ending, The Last of Us Part 1 takes an asshole like Joel and turns him into such a beloved character that weirdos online will scream from the rooftops that he was a good person and always made the right decisions. A true exercise of fantastic writing and characterization on the same echelon as, for example, the evolution of Walter White in Breaking Bad, but with a tenth of the time to do it in. The Last of Us Part 1 does a masterful job at writing someone the Sigma grind pills fucking love. My only overwhelming issue with the game was how quickly this was thrown away for the sake of an impactful ending. But, like I said, been there, done that, covered it ad nauseum, got told to get back in the kitchen. It's the circle of life, friends, and to be fair, my kitchen does need a clean. I do let that shit get bad from time to time. But beyond my issues with the way The Last of Us ended, it's just a good game. One of those titles with the only issues I really have with it due to its age, not quality. The combat's a bit stiff, but it's a PlayStation 3 game remastered twice. It's a miracle that shit plays at all. I played this game through a couple times on easy mode to fully upgrade all of Joel's stats and all the weapons and get plenty of practice and advance for my grounded playthrough, and still approached it with bedwetting anxiety. I mean, I probably could have worked up through the difficulties until I reached grounded, but you get more upgrade materials on easy, so it made no sense besides making an idiot of myself on stream. But rest assured, I made plenty of spectacle of myself. Grounded mode on The Last of Us is hard. It is hilariously hard. I have no doubt that this is actually how the game was intended to be played. It feels like how the experience should be, scrounging for scraps of shit in the cupboards and finding so little things of use. Your characters are desperate and you as the player actually feel desperate. You get to a house and you're like, oh my god, come on, please say there's something I can use to heal in here, and there just never is. Not having enough crafting materials for most of the game to even make a basic shiv, not having access to the weird radar system you have on the other difficulties, it is, in every sense of the word, a completely grounded experience. You die in one or two hits, and healing is so difficult that you basically readjust to your new life at one HP. This is a no-hit run now, boys, look at how advanced a player I am. And yet the absolutely poo ways I would get my shit clapped. Enemies would dodge my killing blows and then in a single frame just be slitting my throat. I'd throw a brick at an enemy, not realise I hadn't actually stunned the enemy because I was hitting it during some weird half animation, run in to finish the job and then just get straight up murdered, one shot sniper rifle kills from halfway across the city amounted to at least 25% of my deaths. I'd walk around in stealth and enemies would sniff me out like a plastic bag full of rotten oranges you keep tucked under your bed because you don't like them but your mum won't stop packing them in your lunchbox and she gets annoyed when you leave them at the end of the day. I have to say I do prefer The Last of Us 2's gameplay in that sense and I wish they'd added those dodge and prone abilities to the first game when they released the 2022 remake and that is why I thought they were remaking the game so that they could adjust the combat segments to account for Joel's new combat abilities but no yeah sure Joel's 50 maybe his knees don't work but man if I had a dodge button when playing as Ellie during her tower defense segment with pedo Dave the world would be a better place but I don't and it isn't anyway there you go after all that pestering I got literally like the four comments I got the endless harassment I didn't receive. There's your review. Enjoy. See you folks next week. So The Last of Us 1, again, I'm reviewing the original or the remaster. I'm not I'm not reviewing the remake. There's so many oh so many versions of this game. I have to put like so many disclaimers whenever I talk about it. I would always recommend The Last of Us. I think it's a good story. I think the gameplay is okay on lower difficulties, but it really hits its stride when you get into like grounded difficulty. I think that's how the game is supposed to be played. But obviously if you don't like that, then you can just lean back and enjoy the story. The online was really fun as well. I played that with my friends uh, Shek and Bohukri. I had a really good time with it. I would say like eight hours. 10. Yeah, good stuff. Oh, okay. Another comment on the comment showcase. So, this person said, Annoying feminist screeching intensifies. Honestly, if you don't like the game, don't play it. Your moralist crusade in clickbaity titles just gave the game free publicity. I didn't knew this game until your video appeared in my recommendations, and it took just a few minutes of your salty review to see that there is a lot of craft and care involved in its creation, and a game that even its detractors can make whole video essays about them can't be that bad. Thanks to other, more nuanced YouTubers, I can see that the game is actually 
worth my time and money, moralists like you aren't going to prevent art. Again, I get these comments at least once a week, all the time from people just with like a single initial as their profile picture. Just the thing to note about these comments is that they take me and the themes I discuss, which in this case is paedophile bad, and then associate that with feminism. And then they take themselves and they put themselves on the opposite side of the dialogue. I think if you're going to associate the protection of vulnerable young teenagers and children with feminism and me, and then try and separate yourself from it and oppose it, you better make sure that your hard drive is locked up tight, because you are saying more about yourself than me when you post these kinds of comments. Also, if you don't like it, don't play it, people are exactly the people who will say you can't judge a game if you've not finished it. How do I know I dislike it if I don't play it? And if I finish it and I hate it, I sure as shit should try and make the most of my experience, right? I should try and take something positive from it. Goalposts just kind of move with these people. It's exhausting. I've long since learned not to bother engaging with them. They're just not worth the time. Dead by Daylight isn't something you do, it's somewhere you end up. It's a Burger King at 6am while your crying friend gets back with her ex in front of a bunch of tired commuters. It's a wimpy when the McDonald's down the road has a ringworm outbreak. It's walking to the shop to get an oven pizza you're not enthused about because the place you actually want to order from keeps rejecting your delivery orders. Is Dead by Daylight something you recommend? I don't think so. I think it's something you warn people against, but they, like you, always succumb to the K-hole that is Dead by Daylight in the end, it is inevitable. We all do. Dead by Daylight isn't especially well made nor well balanced. It's a 4v1, 4 survivors versus 1 killer, in a game of hide and seek. Survivors need to power all the generators and escape through the exit gates. Killers need to kill all of the survivors before they manage this, planting them on hooks to be taken by the entity in an animation that looks like the way zombies float up to the ceiling whenever Dead Rising 2 is about to crash. There's no quick play mode, only ranked, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that throwing the casual solo queues in with the toxic competitive sweats into one big mixing ball of strife is a recipe for disaster. There's no communication whatsoever during matches, not even a proximity chat, not even emotes. You can point, beckon and crouch, and those are the only tools you have to get across whatever you need to get across to one another. The only issue? It means something different to everyone. Someone runs over to you and points. Are they pointing in a direction you want to go? Or are they telling you where the killer is? Christ knows. But the answer will always be the one you don't want to hear. The game is balanced for that lack of communication, allowing you to run perks that give you better visibility of the match, where the other players are and what they're doing, sometimes where the killer is under certain circumstances. As you have four perk slots as killer and survivor, you have to carefully pick the ones you need versus the ones you want. But this means that if you're in a team of four and you're freely speaking back and forth over Discord or voice chat, you don't need to use those visibility perks, now giving you four free slots for other perks to use as you wish. Consequently, having all the visibility you need in a four man just from the good old dog and bone means that matches are extremely easy for four men teams. Add in some meta perks, a few flashlights and a few thousand hours of skill and we have what the regulars call a four man SWF, meaning survive with friends or swoof. And since these four man swoofs are often the upper echelons of Dead by Daylight streaming and tournament fame, it's often what the developers balance for, leaving less experienced and smaller teams of players in the absolute gutter when it comes to balancing. So Solo queue as a survivor and you're basically asked to be sat on the dick of every killer you queue against and spun around like a kebab. Playing killer is fun. I can't say for how long it will be fun. The meta of this game has a special way of flip-flopping so hard between ruining the experience of survivors and killers each. There are different kinds of killers too. Some are stealth based. Some are all about setting up and guarding territory. Some are high mobility killers, either super fast or able to teleport under certain conditions. Some are all about flicting certain status conditions. And some are the nurse, a killer that the developers just cannot seem to comfortably balance, and will either offer a situation whereby all four survivors are massacred in the first 45 seconds, or the four of you will run loops around her until she rage quits in frustration. And yes, I have been both of those nurses, and yes, I have shed tears to this game. At higher levels of skill, only two killers actually really thrive. Nurse, and for all the train spotting fans out there, a Scottish drug addict called Talbot Grimes. Once you reach a certain level of survivor ability, 
party where they're all wearing expensive cosmetics and teabagging at the gate, most killers will only succeed if survivors make mistakes. Personally, once my MMR gets too high, I fuck around for a few matches or put the game down for 15 weeks. A lot of people complain about this game, but they're often the hardcores, the thousands of hours, the rank obsessors, the daily players, but I think if you chill out a little and take this game match by match, like most games, you'll have a much better time. Dead by Daylight is by no means perfect, and god, I emphasise it is by no means perfect, but it's a fun party game and a fairly unique one at that. Every few months they add more DLC and a few more trophies each time, which is obviously the conch call needed to drag me back to the bonfire, but it keeps the game fairly fresh, adds new balancing tweaks and new balancing issues, even if they're major balancing issues that have to be hotfixed. I think loading up this game is enough of a gamble every time that you have no idea what shithousery you're going to encounter. This rich tapestry of constantly shifting meta means you can play for only a few months before you're looking back on it fondly. Remember back when the game wasn't on a timer and survivors could just keep you locked in for hours until you rage quit? Remember back when Wraith's speed was so high and he was so overpowered that he was the only killer you ever went up against? Remember when Jill looked like a goblin? Ah, good times. I've played a lot of Dead by Daylight by this point. On the PS4 I'm sitting on upwards of 600 hours, maybe 800. Over on the PS5 I'm maybe half that. Combined, that's a long time. Do I like it? Christ, I have no idea. I'll have to play some more to find out. The mechanics are okay, the graphics are well below average, and the online is literally fine. So I'm gonna give this one a, a 48 out of 10. Okay, on to the next comment in the comment showcase. So this commenter said, People like you, I will never understand. Y'all's logic is skewed. Y'all want to ban this game, but games like GTA are fine? Like what? Either all of it is okay, or none of it is. I responded, I don't think this game should be banned, I just think it's shit. Uh, so to be clear, I never ever suggest banning games in any of my videos. I don't think games should be banned. I think particularly bad games just don't find platforms because of age ratings and then end up tumbling into obscurity. Like, you can make your pedo game, but nobody is going to host it, and you are going to attract a pretty disgusting demographic if you try and sell it individually. Um, and I certainly won't be going near it, so. You know, every every game has its place in the wider public hive mind, but sometimes they are just a cautionary tale. But any, like, kind of offensive, badly made games that slip through the gap are fair game for me to call shit, and I'm well within my rights to talk about how shit they are. Also, I have played about 400 hours of GTA V, and I can safely say it doesn't rely on the sexual assault of women for easy shock value or story beats. Say what you want about GTA 5, but it's rooted very firmly in satire and I would say that the story is solid without needing to resort to like random sexual assaults. You know, it's it makes its own story. Like there's, there are women in it, I, I think it's good. This commenter has clearly also never played GTA and you can tell that by the way they say you want to ban this game but games like GTA are fine. There are more GTA games out now than fucking reasons why, spanning what, like three decades? To lump them together is showing your ignorance. You can't compare them at this point. So, after streaming for three years on Twitch, me and chat started to discover a bit of a trend. That trend was, should anybody donate a game to the stream to be streamed, they would never be present for us to actually play it. So when the weird guy, who made me feel so creepily observed that I wore hoodies forever, sent me a day one copy of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it was only fit for him to vanish. Thank god, freedom. He was probably gonna get banned sooner or later anyway. I wonder what became of him. Oh fuck, yeah, this is a review, sorry, yes. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is fine. It is literally okay. A lot of my friends burned out grabbing the collectibles, but it was my first Assassin's Creed game, and I played it in small and infrequent enough amounts that it took me about six months to get the plat, but I came away just kind of feeling alright. I didn't dislike it, no, but I never liked it either. There's a lot of it too, which means so little of it actually becomes memorable. I know there was a part during a certain arc where someone sat up and said something to a group of three people, and they stared at him funny, but in the muddle I can't remember the arc, the story, nor even the context of the situation. I just know it made me laugh a bit and go, oh yeah, yeah, uh, that, that was actually pretty funny, that was. I quite enjoyed the combat, but it was muddled down by one of the most granular upgrade systems I've ever seen. You have an utterly enormous web of available upgrades, literally hundreds of them, and by the time you finish the game, you'll probably be sitting comfortably over the level cap of 430, probably well into the 500s if you do all of the DLC. You get one upgrade per level, so all the upgrades are things like, do 
plus 1.2 times melee damage with one-handed weapons. Reduce fall damage by 1%. Regain 0.3% of your wife's respect. By the time you finish the game, you are pretty overpowered, and the combat becomes very fun, but that's almost 200 hours of content gone by, so it's not really a feather in its cap. You can just play a fun game and have fun from the start. The point of this game with the story really seems to have some passion in it is anything to do with mythology. You can clearly see that the writers and designers of this game want to make games about historical mythology now, and by god, let these people go free. Vikings are only assassins in the same way that a cloud of mustard gas is a gun. All they have in common is that people die. Sometimes that's the person you're aiming to have killed, but beyond that, there's not much overlap. And you can feel it too. I've not even played the earlier Assassin's Creed games, and I still saw how half-heartedly they injected assassinations and tracking missions into this game, shoulders slumped and dragging their feet along the floor. Oh, there's an ancient order of ancient orders that I need to disrupt to kill the ancient order? I need to find clues as to their location? Oh, and then I just walk in and beat the shit out of them? Man, I'm a vigilante PI, not an assassin. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a game. It exists. It has characters and a story, and there's a setting. It has a map. It's an extremely big map. But even accommodating the entire story and all the collectibles and all the side quests, it could reasonably be a quarter of the size. And that's just the main map. There are five or six more in the base game alone, not including the ones that are added through DLC. I played this on the PlayStation 4, and it would take upwards of 10 minutes just to load the game for the first time. Fast travelling was a two minute loading time each time. Imagine traversing this map under those conditions. It was faster to walk. When that platinum trophy popped, I put this game behind me without a single thought beyond Cool, what next? And now every few months one of my friends will resurrect a group chat to go, oh fuck's sake guys. We all take the bait and ask what's wrong and then my friend will just send a screenshot of some more DLC and we all groan but then I'll sit down and dutifully just get through it together. Now with all DLC included, the game is about 200 hours and I think there's still more DLC on the way. And like, the problem with this game isn't anything about it having especially negative qualities. Sure, it is a bit buggy, but the content is adequate. It's all right. I wasn't miserable with it. After the first 120 hour collectathon of the main game, they added three more 15 hour collectathons, a roguelike DLC, two 5 hour cave exploration DLCs, and definitely the buggiest of them all as I played them on release, and I was snapping my own legs with furious rage, but a mastery challenges DLC where the precision required was nowhere near the precision implemented, so enemies would just spawn out of bounds or accidentally kill themselves, and since you needed to kill all enemies yourself, that was a bad thing to happen. I fell through the floor a few times too, it's just messy shit. Even starting the Mastery Challenges DLC was an experience fraught with stress, being that mine was so bugged that I had to revert to a save about 20 hours earlier before it would even spawn, a common issue looking at the forum posts on the topic. It was a shame too. This was easily the least polished DLC but had the most promise. I enjoyed it when it worked. But the problem with Assassin's Creed Valhalla is that it's just not that great. It's fine. It's fairly good in places, but it's mostly some of the most milk toast, unmemorable experiences you'll ever have. It's like the carrots on a Sunday roast. I mean, I like carrots. I'll eat them, no complaints, they're fine, but if you gave me an entire plate of them steamed plain with no gravy or even salt and pepper, yeah, I mean, I'll get through it, I suppose, but I wouldn't have much to remember besides the time I was given a weirdly large amount of carrots to eat. That's all Valhalla is to me. For what it's worth, it's just too long. I think that I'd rather play 20 amazing 10-hour games than one meh 200-hour game. The experience is okay, but the breadth was so extreme that I don't think there's anybody I would ever recommend this to, at least without an enormous asterisk on the side. Because which human person would you recommend an entire a dry plate of carrots to. So, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I don't think I would recommend this game to anybody. It's one of those where it's like, it's literally average but it's average for 250 hours. And it's another one of those experiences where it's like, you could play this, but you could also probably spend 250 hours on something better. I would rather have 10 brilliant 10 hour experiences than one average 250 hour experience. The mechanics were average. They've been done better elsewhere. The skill tree was appalling. I do not understand whose idea that was. It was so incremental and it was so like nitty gritty. It was so irritating. The graphics were good. The story was below average. I very fastidiously kept track of it for the first 40 hours of like all the side quests I was doing, all the main quests, I really carefully watched all the cutscenes and paid attention to all the dialogue. And then I think literally about 40 hours in, I was like, I'm so bored. And I just skipped them, skipped it after that. I mean, I made a good effort. For me, that's a lot. For those of you who've watched my content before, watching 40 hours of cutscenes is more than I would do for any other game. Uh, I would give this game a three out of 10 at best. 
Okay, so next comment on the comment showcase. Wait, you will say fuck, but you won't say the R slur? I'm still not gonna say it. Edit. Also, I know this game is written by a man, but honestly, how fucking dare you for being surprised that this could have been written by a woman? As if women can't possibly write filth like this fucking game. You come across, thanks to that one line, as somebody who doesn't believe that women can rape, you fucking cow. And then they liked their own comment. Uh, and then also there was this little extra one underneath that just said I can't believe I listened to a woman for over an hour, which I decided to take as a compliment. So I made a little mistake in my Rachel Foster video where I thought a woman had written it and I acted accordingly surprised. And as you can see from this completely well adjusted reprobate, some people took that to mean that I was implying that women are incapable of doing bad things. I had to field a lot of abuse and a lot of it was just as bad as this. Some of it was worse. It was a really hard few weeks. I had been blown up from 100 subscribers. I suddenly had like 28,000 and I was getting messages like this like 10 times a day. It was really horrible. Uh, as I said before, being in the shoes of a woman when the victim of the game is also a young girl for me would be extra insensitive. What, what I'm trying to say is if I wrote a game about a little girl who got abused I should be writing a good game and that little girl should be seeing justice through my writing. Like she can still die you know whatever but narratively I should be doing her justice. Like I used to be a little girl there would be aspects of myself I would write into that character and making her some 2D victim would be a huge disservice both to this fictional character but also to my child childhood me. Same if the author was a man and the victim was a boy. You're essentially writing your younger self even if you don't know it. You know, whoever wrote the characters Rachel and Nicole has absolutely no idea how young women behave or for the record speak and has no respect for women whatsoever. And that was why I was surprised that I assumed a woman had written the game and as it turns out it was a man so that's on me but please stop calling me a fucking cow, it happens all the time. Man, I have never ever in my life missed being a kid. Growing up in a world of computers shaped like fridges that couldn't be used if somebody was on the phone, having to rewind a plastic box full of tape every time I wanted to watch a Land Before Time, sharing a single TV with three other people who all wanted to watch completely different things at the same time, but this game kinda did it for me. See, I grew up in the days of PlayStation 1 platformers, Spyro, Crash Bandicoot, Pandemonium 2, that amazing little Monsters Inc. tie-in game. If I'd gotten my dirty little hands on Medieval, I'd have grown up a stoic, broken woman indeed, but a strong one. But Pumpkin Jack? Yeah, I think that would have fit in just fine with my roster. Cute little platformers are my jam. I'm so extremely biased towards them, be warned, but they are such an underrepresented genre, especially, and counterintuitively, for adults like me that want to relive their childhood nostalgia, but also don't want to be bored when, surprise surprise, the childlike platformer they've picked up is too easy. Wow, what a shocker. I've done Ukulele, I've done Yoku's Island Express, I've done, I guess, at a push, Okami? But the grass is thin below my feet and my mouth is dry. A man who goes to bed with an itchy butthole wakes up with a smelly finger and boy it's better to be proactive when a reeking hand is at stake. So when the opportunity to play Pumpkin Jack via key mailer arose I jumped on it. Like I don't request games on that website very much mainly because of the obligation that I then have to play and talk about them which is kind of a pain in the arse and completely a reap so situation but I saw Pumpkin Jack and I dove in head first and well Pumpkin Jack is good shit. It's rough around the edges, a little cobbled together, the controls are a bit floaty and a bit imprecise but the Roughness is mostly visual. It kind of looks a bit unfinished, like we're in an out of bounds area and the environment is less detailed because the developers don't expect you to have access to it. The assets are all there, it's all cohesive, there's no clipping and it's very well put together, but visually there's something about it that I just feel is missing and I can't put my finger on it. Some final layer of more intricate detail. Plus sometimes I go to jump on what I think is the ground and Jack will just fall to his death. Whoopsie. But it's charming. The music fits and the colour scheme is fucking spot on. Crammed full of pop culture references references, this game is beautiful. I'd love to tell you the story of Pumpkin Jack, but my attention span is so minute that I couldn't bear to sit through the like two minute introductory cutscene. I was just so excited to get into the game, I apologise for my gumption. We pilot Pumpkin Jack, a headless horseman type fella with, as you can imagine, the head of a pumpkin. You can dress him in a bunch of different outfits that are adorably puns on his own name. He can be Lumberjack, Samurai Jack, etc. and gosh isn't that just so sweet? There are six levels in this game, all roughly linear, but with some offshooting paths that often lead to collectibles. 
levels. All of them have classic platformer bosses at the end with their three stages and their weak points and their moments where you can actually do damage to them. It took me right back to my first days on Spyro, getting smacked left and right by Toasty and left for dead along the side of the M25. Jack has different weapons too that you can unlock per level, starting with a shovel, but by level three you've got a haunted sword and Jack will float around with his arms out like the vampire lord from Skyrim, except somehow so much easier and more rewarding to use. Fuck you Skyrim vampire lord. Pumpkin Jack is surrounded by birds and not in a shagger way, like a literal avian way. He has a crow friend and an owl friend who provide context and direction as you play, which is useful because I am a rampant slapper and I skip cutscenes, which is a shame too. What of the cutscenes I watched showed a very dry sense of humour with the occasional fourth wall break and I mean if that doesn't tell you what this game is paying homage to, nothing will. And oh man it was a breath of fresh air for me this game. In a way I can only imagine paying homage to medieval, the combat in this game is simple but surprisingly challenging. Enemies spawn out of the ground and cluster up, forming big numbers quickly and it's not the kind of chill combat you can look away from. You have health, sure, but everything hits like that first step out of the pub into the cold night air. You're fine and then all of a sudden you're on the floor and a kebab is the only thing that can save you. Despite this game's short runtime, you can clearly see it was made with effort from a team who genuinely wanted to make something enjoyable. This could be a face roll A to B journey, but they add in several segments with different mechanics to keep things fresh, including sections where you need to pilot minecarts or run on the back of ghostly horses. As in, the horse is running, not you running on the back of a stationary dead horse. They're all sick, except one segment where you have to kick a bomb around some wooden platforms. This segment is tricky enough to be a thorn in my ass as it is, but the hitbox on that bomb gave me hemorrhoids. I'd have it a few feet away from a lever, go to hit the lever, and I'd just send this bomb flying off into the water below, forcing me to restart. It took me like 30 tries to get through this bastard section, but only the first one really gave me any issues, the other ones after were pretty cool. But like I said, bias, bias, bias. My inner child was utterly over the moon with this game, screaming in my ear with excitement until I couldn't really hear anything else. I couldn't even begin to judge this on its own merit beyond nostalgia makes me happy. What? This was made by one guy? Never mind. 10 out of 10. Review's over. Pumpkin Jack. I would recommend this game. I think overall everything about it is just good. Not excellent, not average, good. Literally 6, 7 out of 10 across the board. In fact, I would give this game a 6 out of 10. I would recommend it. It's short, there's not a lot of meat on the bones. It's like the gameplay loop of Spyro, which I really like, but something felt like it was missing and I just could never put my finger on what it was. It was, I don't know, it's just something didn't quite feel finished and I couldn't couldn't describe it to you. So I'd give this game a 6 out of 10 and I would recommend it. It's not bad. Okay, next comment in the comment showcase. This one was great. It said, I'll let you feel hell. This is a ferris wheel compared to the depravity and repulsion in my mind. Welcome to Sodom with open arms and legs and other orifices. First of all, other orifices? Arms and legs aren't orifices. You could just say arms, legs and orifices, but whatever. This guy was hilarious because he posted this comment and then a few others that I didn't screenshot on a bunch of my videos and when I replied asking him what on earth he was talking talking about they vanished so I can only assume he just deleted them out of shame and cringe because these are some of the cringiest comments I've ever received. I've never seen someone so edgy as to look at this game and go yeah that's nothing compared to what goes on in my head minute to minute and in their head they just replay the scene from Family Guy where the front of Lois's dress gets wet or they think about a time they accidentally saw their cousin getting changed before going in the swimming pool. I'm sure if what was going in your head was that bad you probably wouldn't want to admit it online. On PSN, games can have descriptions, optional little tidbits of information to show on the home screen that roughly describe the core gameplay premise to you. For Carrion, a game about being a hulking tentacle monster that eats screaming terrified humans in order to grow bigger and stronger, the description is stalk, consume, grow, evolve. For Lemon Cake, a precious comfy pastel bakery simulator, it's restore an abandoned bakery and prepare pastries from farm to table. Overwatch 2 doesn't have a description for some reason, but I I imagine it was more a bug than a feature. For Farm For Your Life, the description is just farm management. Farm management. Farm management, I thought. Watching my grandfather get torn to shreds by zombies after the tutorial of this game concluded. Thinking back to mere seconds ago when I was whacking weeds and milking cows. Farm management, I said, toggling on peaceful mode to prevent my homestead being overrun by flesh-eating hordes of the dead as soon as night rolled around. Farm management? Yeah, farm management. Farm For Your Life was a game I 
it's not super optimistic for. It looks like a mobile game and it plays very clunky. The movement isn't entirely grid based, nor entirely isometric, nor entirely aligned with the d-pad or analog stick. The written English isn't excellently translated, although it does get across what it needs to do, which is the most important part. Basic aspects of the game are tutorialised, such as milking cows and farming vegetables, but the absolutely key mechanics that bridge those together, i.e. keeping plants alive, fertiliser, finding and using farmhands to cover your bases so that you can actually get anything of importance done, are not. I had a big cart of logs to wheel around and make fences with, but when I built a tent with my groundsman, he just wished the tent into life right on the square where my cart was sat, and while I could see my cart clipping jarringly out the side of it for the rest of the game, I couldn't use it for the rest of my entire playthrough, it was trapped forever. Farm for Your Life does involve farming, but it's a game that requires momentum. Sure, you can plant a patch of sweet corn and a few potatoes, but they dehydrate so fast that if you insist on trying to keep them alive yourself, you'll be watering them probably every two minutes. You can make sprinklers with the scraps you get from customers at your restaurant, because not only do you manage a farm, but also an eatery, but the time you spend in the eatery serving customers and bartering for useful doodads, the less time you have for farm management. And after one particularly busy five minutes in the restaurant, I returned to my humble vegetable patch to find everything dead. I was broken. That being said, it's easy enough to build up, and once I realised that the shivering stranger by the dead fire pit at the dilapidated campsite needed somewhere to live, willing to pay in labour and handies, I constructed him a tent and he went off to work, for about 45 seconds. He then returned to the tent and asked for a plate of baked corn before doing any more work. Corn, I thought. Corn in exchange for farm management? Fuck you, friend, I said, and instead constructed a little fence in front of his tent. Now, no longer with a place to lay his head nor a reason to stop working, my new friend worked 24-7 on my humble fields, never having the gall to ask for baked corn again. Cruel, yes but effective. Once you get the ball rolling with farm hands, you can have up to three in story mode and four in endless mode, the game becomes a lot easier and you can stop hovering over protectively near your pumpkin patch in case they start crying for mulch or a drop of water. Seriously? Get some yourself. As long as you leave out useful things like bags of fertiliser, your farm hands will take care of the rest and you can focus on the restaurant, watching your crops gradually, well, crop up in numbers. You can use your slowly growing pile of goodies to barter with the shopkeeper, a silent and stoic NPC that stands completely central in your town with an empty cart who asks for like a hundred rods of corn in exchange for one bag of seeds and won't take a rod less. But from her you can get new tools and recipes, new seed types and raw materials should you need them. New recipes are learned in a fruit ninja style minigame where the ingredients just whiz across the screen and you have to smack them down with the right buttons, it's very charming. Customers barter for their meal at the door, yes I will give you a glass of apple juice and a plate of baked potato in exchange for 15 pieces of scrap, then they sit themselves down and wait however long it takes to be served. They will sit there for as long as you need. I accidentally said yes to somebody who wanted a fried egg, not owning a chicken myself, and he sat in that seat for probably about 20 days straight until the mega expensive chicken I finally purchased strained out her first egg. Of course you can get farmhands to help in the restaurant too, all you need to do is stand at the door and barter the entry fee and the farmhands will handle the rest. The groundsman will also take your hard earned goodies in exchange for building more tents for more farmhands, appliances for your restaurant, and defence mechanisms for your homestead against the aforementioned Horde of the Undead. This really was a sleeper Halloween hit for me. I mean, yeah, despite its looks and its controls, I got a wee bit addicted to this. I sat in a PSN call with some friends, all asking when I'd be on Overwatch 2, just going, yeah, two minutes, sorry, just, just doing something, what, two seconds, two seconds, whilst cramming my pockets full of heads of lettuce and loose wooden logs. I bought everything from my farm, not that there's loads, I constructed intricate fences and made a homestead I was very happy with. It's a shame there wasn't more content. I'd rinsed this game through thoroughly on story mode and endless mode in the space of about 10 hours, and customization options are very limited. You can't make cute little gazebos or fountains or plant decorative flowers or upgrade any of your buildings, so you'll likely see everything this game has to offer within only a few hours, which I suppose is actually quite contrary to mobile games, which often try and keep you in the loop for as long as humanly possible. Still, it was a lesson for me. Don't judge a book by its cover, and don't judge a farm by its management. Right, farm for your life. Farm for Your Life, so weirdly, I actually would recommend this game. The mechanics are okay, the graphics are below average, and the story is just just bad. Literally a 5 out of 10. I I loved it. I, I actually adored my time with it, and I recommended it to people as soon as I was finished with it. I could not tell you why. I thought it was really good, and it was also terrible.
Okay, next comment on the comment showcase. This one said, Someone's bitter, she's old and not a teenager anymore, LMFAO. 16 is the age of consent in most places around the world, you hag. So this one is brilliant because it is a trend I see a lot in so many of my comments all the way through to today. See, I'm English, if that wasn't already obvious. In England, the age of consent is 16. But so many people assume that I'm American. I get accused of being a moralist American who's trying to impose her silly laws all over the planet, probably weekly. I get told over here in Europe, we don't subscribe to your stupid moral pandering. And then I reply, I am in Europe, and then they delete their comment. I don't think I sound particularly American, but apparently my vibes are straight up Yankee Doodle. So if you didn't know it before, I am English. Please stop accusing me of being American, it's very upsetting. Those of you who know me know that I have a very strict PlayStation games only rule. Not because of any console elitism, but more because I just don't want every screen in my house to revolve around playing games. The PC is for my job, and if I start buying PC games, I'm going to be spending far too much time fucking around on Steam than I am actually doing any work. With one exception. Golf With Your Friends is a game I was introduced to during my time at university. Me and my loser friends picked it up and were suddenly obsessed. We'd go around to each other's houses to play, we penned a drinking game we just called Drink with your friends, which just sounds like we crack a beer open on the sofa, but in reality it is a tense and exciting roller coaster, an exploration of man's precision, accuracy, and the ability to bounce back from certain failure. Essentially, you just take a drink for every shot you get over par per hole. So, as you can imagine, performance deteriorates, leading to more drinks, leading to more drinks, leading to more shots, leading to less holes, leading to worse performance, on and on and on until you've fallen asleep in the back garden at 3pm on a Tuesday. I miss university sometimes. Back then, and Golf With Your Friends had only three courses, Forest, Oasis, and Twilight. The arrival of the Candyland update was a genuine excuse to gather together and all play it. Like Mozart dropping a fresh new banger, the excitement in the room was palpable, a beige living room crammed with third-hand furniture and the sparks of genuine excitement, a clergy of worshippers at the feet of one random developer who sat hunched over some PC somewhere figuring out golf ball physics. Since those days, Golf With Your Friends is a must-have on any gaming machine that will accommodate it. It's as ingrained in my lifestyle as the operating system it's squats on, breathing heavily. It's a must-have for me. So when it came to PlayStation, you can bet I was on it faster than bird shit on the washing line. I love this game. Golf With Your Friends is an extremely simple concept, but I often find that in gaming, simple tends to work best. I mean, you're playing golf. Well, you're not even a person, you are the ball, propelled by some kind of mysticism to draw lines backwards from your position, letting go to propel yourself forwards at great speeds, pinging through the air like the Think Fast Diet Coke cans my brother pelts at my head whenever I make the humble mistake of asking for one. You can dress your ball up, make it a duck, a pie, a brain, give it a pretty trail or a cool dinghy for when it hits the water, change the colour. The customization options are surprisingly extensive, unlocked randomly after completing certain in-game requirements, such as earning par on certain courses and playing them on certain modes. There's hockey, where you pilot a little puck and try to get it past the gingerbread goalies. There's a basketball variation where you need to dunk said ball through the net. There's party versions where your ball shape will randomly change between rounds, power-ups that change other people's balls or leave little puddles of honey on the floor to get them stuck in, or let you double jump. High gravity, low gravity, jumps on or off, collisions on or off, different shapes, different timers, different shot limitations. The customization of the games you can play is fantastically fun, making every new game fresh and giving the host a new opportunity every go around to wind everyone up. Ultimately, as with any game of golf that isn't played in The Last of Us 2, your primary objective is getting your ball into the hole that has a big flag poking out of it. And this is crazy golf, so you can expect obstacles, puzzles, and a ball faced ignorance of physics. The laws of nature are adjustable in golf with your friends, anything is possible, even rolling your ball into a random barrel in the training grounds and watching it slide into the gullet of an impossibly enormous gingerbread man. These perversions of reality are visible across all maps. Beyond the original four we have nautical themed maps, museums, prehistoric maps, maps on the front line. You can bounce off big cubes of jelly, use water to take risky shortcuts, bobbing along in your floaty, fly through anti-gravity pipes on a space station. Mechanically the game is weirdly linear, as in course one is the simplest it will get, and the final course is always the most complex option on the table. I don't even know if this was intentional, but more the natural progression of the developer's own ability, and the natural deterioration of whatever their mental state may have been, as they churned out course upon course upon course. Eventually you're using jetpacks and getting blown up by cows. There's a lot more to this game than turning collisions on and just knocking your friends away from the hole. Water physics, wind physics, gravity puzzles, portals, it's deceptively complex. Still, the game has a fairly alpha feeling, even upwards of six years after 
to release. There are some maps, looking at Volcano specifically, where it is so easy to accidentally glitch through walls and into the environment, and then just be stuck there until the timer runs out, granting you an enormous 14 point penalty that will unfairly destroy any lead you may have, or any opportunity at getting par. What's also fantastic is that the physics always end up getting tweaked ever so slightly, every few patches, so any YouTube guide that's even a few updates old will suddenly be entirely obsolete. Or like, some of the strategies for some of the holes will work. When I was trying to get the trophy for getting par on one of the maps I hated and wanted to spend the least possible time on, the Worms map, I was flicking between three or four different guides, all slightly approximately accurate in their teachings, but never complete nor fully accurate. The game is entirely playable solo, but I would never recommend it solo, only ever in groups, no matter the purpose. Even if you're just trophy hunting, it gives you an opportunity to communicate what works and what doesn't, whether you need to point at the second palm tree from the left and give it just under two bars of force, or whether you should just play it safe and follow the course itself. It's a game that's always a pleasure to introduce to friends for the first time. One of my favourite moments with this title was introducing three trophy hunting friends to it, excited for a chill time and some laughs and some beautiful collaboration, only to find out the three of them were so dedicated to excelling in every single map, even when playing it for the first time with no previous experience, that I was privy to some of the most extreme table flipping rage. I listened to a man from Milton Keynes punch holes in his walls for hours. Still, he said he enjoyed it. Okay. Golf with your friends. Yes, I would always recommend this game. This game is fucking shaggable. It's brilliant. Mechanics are literally exactly what you expect from golf. They're made with love by a developer that really cares about the experience that they're making. The graphics are fine, but it's mini golf and mini golf courses always look a little bit tacky. So like the dinosaurs in the mini golf just kind of move like Disney automatons and it's like, yeah, that's 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 good for mini golf. My friends and I play a lot of mini golf. We always go to a different mini golf place as well. I'm what you call a connoisseur of mini golf. There's no story. I would give this game a 7 out of 10. I would absolutely recommend this, especially with friends and especially with a drink. Ah, okay. So this comment on the comment showcase said, I saw you as a potential channel to be a fan of, but when you told people who disagree with the every game has politics opinion, they can dislike the video and fuck off. Like, how trashy are you? How horrible to tell people who merely think it's possible for a game to have no politics to fuck off, including me. I guess people who say online tic-tac-toe has no politics politics should fuck off according to you. I said, haha, well, thanks for being here anyway, because I mean, what do you say to that? But this is definitely an instance of someone taking something so personally in a video that they can only assume I am speaking directly to them. And they end up getting these pathetic little outbursts where they're obviously trying to rectify the fact that I don't know they exist with the fact that I've also just simultaneously hurt their feelings. Like if I'm watching a video and I hear something I don't agree with, if the video is good regardless, I'll keep watching. If I didn't like the video that much anyway, I just click elsewhere. I don't even dislike videos. Like, I'm, I'm not that petty. I just, I don't care. But I always get a few fragile egos in my comment section who are like, um, you've really bothered me with that. And then they have to explain to me who they are. Unfortunately, games are inseparable from everyday politics. You can't make something without being influenced by your life and your life has a fuckload of politics in it. Even Nintendo who go out of their way to make apolitical games are influenced by politics because of the themes they intentionally avoid and work around. Aiming to be apolitical is still political. Sorry to break it to you. Side note, it's always fans of like Call of Duty and GTA 5 who dropped this politics shit in my comments. Have some self-awareness, come on. I don't make much of a secret of the fact that I very, very rarely enjoy a JRPG. I'm not a fan of over-the-top three barely legal teenagers having to save the world from Super Satan kind of writing those games often take on. I don't like cringy character dialogue and excessive exposition when things are often very obvious on screen. I hate the creepy humour tropes that often just revolve around looking up characters' skirts or falling on them and accidentally getting your head stuck in some schoolgirl's cleavage. I hate having 10 hour tutorials crammed down my throat. I hate having characters that accompany me throughout the game just to pause me every three minutes to loudly and over the course of several dialogue windows re-explain to me what I was already trying to do. But I like Okami and it might be the only JRPG that I honestly not only love but heartily recommend. Okami was almost the first platinum trophy I ever earned. I'd almost finished the game in its entirety when the Spyro remake trilogy suddenly came out, at which point I skipped over to grab the platinum Spyro 1, then swung back to finally knock Okami off the list. Okami has a lot of traits I would normally hate. See my initial paragraph in this review, but most 
specifically your closest in-game companion, a little green imp called Ishan. Ishan is a character whose primary purpose is to wait for you to feel like you're getting into a good flow, enjoying the game, figuring things out well, enjoying what's going on, then suddenly and jarringly stopping you, pausing the game, then spending a few minutes telling you to do what you're literally in the process of doing. Every time you walk through a door, every time you encounter something new, every time you get a new technique, this man is absolutely on it, sprinting over to where you're sitting on the sofa and just laying his big annoying bollocks on your forehead when you're just trying to play a game. I can't fucking stand him, but I enjoy the game despite him, not because of him. I feel like a lot of JRPGs don't trust you to think even for a second, even when their game's framed around puzzles. So many times in Okami I would encounter a fairly simple puzzle. Say, I find a large ball and there's a ball-shaped divot in the floor with a button in it. Okay, I think, ball goes in divot, presses button. At this point, Ishin will dive bomb me to explain that the ball is ball-shaped. The camera will zoom in on the ball, and the divot is ball-shaped. The camera will zoom in on the divot. Then, to add insult to injury, Ishin will go, hmm, I wonder if you could push that ball into that divot, and any modicum of personal satisfaction is obliterated. Yet, the game somehow excels beyond so many other games I've played. Okami is utterly beloved to me because it's a game that outside of any moment spent with Ishin values my time. Often I find JRPGs stretch their length with item farming or experience grinds, but there are no levels in Okami, there are no items to grind. Rather, Okami cultivates its 70 hour 100% with a huge breadth of content. There's 2D platforming sections, box smashing minigames, fishing, wave based combat gates, collectibles, a secret sect of guardian dogs you have to hunt down and recruit, painting shit, picking veggies, doing small side quests for locals like building them water wheels or washing lines with your powers. There's nothing in this game you're doing for too long. It always keeps things fresh, always gives you new and interesting activities to do to collect what you need to collect for the platinum. The combat is standard but free flowing and fun, centered around hitting enemies with various moves to build combos and allowing you to style on enemies with your godly powers. Weapons come in only three or four categories and any differences between them are purely visual but more serve to let you customize your doggo however you prefer which is nice. There are huge swathes of enemy types all neatly filed away in your bestiary whenever you meet a new one for the first time and you need to collect them all for a trophy. Unfortunately I missed one in an area I only visited once and couldn't return to and had to do a speed run jaunt through New Game Plus to be able to encounter it again but you know what I didn't mind. In fact my favorite thing about Okami is the story. Hilariously this is a game that you finish and then another story just appears at the end of it. The final boss? Yeah you beat him and someone goes oh whoops there's another greater evil just over there right down the road and you go down the road and you vanquish this greater evil and when the credits don't roll you get notified that while it's all well and good that you've killed this super evil final boss there's actually a mega super evil boss just up north in the mountains rinse and repeat. You'd think this would wind me the fuck up but I remember being like yes more Okami more story more awesome bosses in this fantastic art style that I can spend ages beating the shit out of. More puzzle sections more astrology bits and pieces more regions more characters more secrets more exploration. In that way Okami is a huge exception for me being that a dragged out story is something that would typically annoy me so much that I would write to my local MP in a drunken rage but considering the absolute truckload of annoying JRPG tropes that this game comes laden with and yet is somehow one of my favorite games of all time I would say that it is simply just an exceptional game and if you don't like JRPGs just like me I imagine you'd probably love it too. So Okami would I recommend Okami? Yes. Okami is fantastic and I hate JRPGs. I can't stand them. I have played so few that I have enjoyed. Okami I loved so much. I have recommended it to so many people. I think the mechanics are brilliant, wonderfully well-rounded. The graphics are beautiful. It has such a unique style that you will recognize anywhere years after playing it. The story is fine. The boss fights are just in oh, seven out of 10. Really good. Absolutely really good. So next on the comment showcase is a fantastically unhinged rant. So this comment said, fucking hell, one scare and now we already have people who consider the refusal to lock everyone up into years of home arrest to be the mark of a bad guy? Listen to me, lady. Mass arrests and imprisonments of innocent people is what bad guys do. And it would serve you well to remember that, lest you want to be amongst those who will cheer for the next Fuhrer Adolf. And then they quoted a bit where I said, I'm definitely not the best person to assess a game's story. And they said, also definitely not the best person to assess 
reality, good and evil, and stuff like that. Uh, so as you can see, I was really confused by this comment. I didn't understand what they were talking about. But this was on my Dishonored video. When the gracious Empress Jessamine saw a plague infest her cities, she decided not to quarantine her dying subjects. In light of the COVID pandemic, I made a joke about how she's probably anti-vax as well. So naturally, this person compared me to Hitler and told me I'm not equipped to assess reality properly. I guess a general regard for human rights is now a symptom of fascism? Like, it was just a joke, my little apple pie, my steaming crumb. There's no need to bring the Nazis into every fucking conversation. I can only imagine your Thanksgiving, should you celebrate it of course, was the tensest dinner table in the Northern Hemisphere. I, I, my only mental image of this guy is like that of the racist uncle who just rants and wears their MAGA hat. Like, lighten up a bit. Welcome to Harvest Moon Light. I mean, Potion Permit. Yeah, I'm showing my hand with this one early. So, Potion Permit is, in many ways, the Harvest Moon that teenage me needed. I don't know which of you played the original Harvest Moon games back on Game Boy Advance and DS, but those games were mad grindy. Not even just for the basics, there being 120 full in-game days per year, a full in-game calendar full of birthdays, festival days, and horrifyingly intricate NPC routes that would have Bethesda falling on their arse with terror, but also for the, well, the sake of grind. As a classic JRPG, is that what they were? Farming simulator? I don't even know. Harvest Moon had some crazy requirements that took hundreds of hours to complete, such as getting your farm to max rank, a feat that required like 1 million farm points when shipping a crop gave you like 2 points. It was silly, silly grind in many ways. Potion Permit takes those farming and brewing and cooking and side hustling and befriending mechanics and simplifies them, whilst also adding some breadth to the game, like combat, monsters, loot to be turned into potions, part-time jobs, a medical clinic you get patients in that you have to diagnose and treat in a timely manner, a dog that follows you everywhere, eat your heart out Blair Witch, a community notice board full of requests and rewards, tons of community events. The actual way you perform these tasks has more depth too. To brew a potion you don't just grab the requisite ingredients and smash them together in a cauldron, you can brew a potion out of many ingredients. Some accept a smaller range of ingredients but most will allow you to brew potions out of anything, and you slot these ingredients together like Tetris box into the correct shape. You mash X to crush graves for the cute nun in the church, you follow on-screen directions to pack boxes for the postman, you execute sick dodge rolls to avoid deadly attacks from black bears and blue bears. The opportunities really are limitless. Still, as with most indie titles, this one wasn't without its share of issues. Namely, and perhaps most importantly, was its Russian roulette issue of save corruption. Every time I finished a play session, I had to back my saves straight up to the cloud as I was explicitly warned that I'd open it to find my save file corrupted and wiped, having to re-download from the cloud once more. It only happened to me once on a 5 hour save file, but it's one of those things, once it happens once, you never trust the game again. I don't even know how either. There's only one way to save the game, by sleeping, and after you sleep you give it a moment, then press quit to title, then gently leave the application and rock the thing to sleep, and somehow it'll still shit the bed. It's really common too, not some likely rumour you hear on Steam forums from 18 months ago, a genuine inevitable issue that will happen to you, so back up your saves if you play it. The issue with this means that you just can't really settle into the story, there's no trust with the user. There are some trophies that require you to do things like chop a thousand rocks and those were the trophies that took me the longest time. Imagine if my save had corrupted at like 900, I would have to start the game again, start the story again, level up my tools again all the way to max level, which requires me to finish the entire story and then go chopping. And if a user doesn't trust your game to work on a fundamental level, they certainly will never truly like the experience. That being said, there was other shit that bothered me. The fishing minigame isn't very well explained whatsoever, so I was hammering X until I had carpal tunnel syndrome at first, until I realised it's a much more guided swap between holding X and tapping it whenever the fish gets mad at you and tries to run away. You get a dog that, like for my first 20 in-game days, I just assumed had zero purpose and actually kind of got on my nerves. It just follows you around, needing pets and food once a day, like many normal dogs I suppose, but there was no option to leave it at home and I got really bored having to scrounge up meals for it every 10 minutes, but one day I needed to find some bitch that I'd met briefly once before and what do you know? You can 
give the name of the NPC you want to find to your dog and they'll go flying off in the NPC's direction, which was absurdly useful and very much appreciated. I'm sorry for judging you, doggy. Upon finding out you can date in the game, I zeroed in on some broad called Martha because she was a barmaid who kind of gave me the impression that she had massive tits and I felt like my character would really want that in a partner. The only issue is that these people are purely pixels on screen, like 8-bit characters, and there's no close-up pictures when they're chatting that would really add a bit of characterization to a lot of these sprites. Even ones I don't think my character should bone. It adds a bit of charm, otherwise they just feel like Pokemon Overworld sprites leading me to the Pokemon and telling me I can use the save option in my pause menu whenever I want to break. Ultimately, I do enjoy games like this for their peaceful repetition. The gamification of work allowing me to dip my toes into lives I might have lived in an alternative world. Medicine, alchemy, functioning postal services. I enjoy getting to take a peek into a little world, farm for some sap, cut down trees and upgrade my cauldron. It's easy. It's something you can build slowly provided it doesn't corrupt after 15 hours. Especially when the trophies are just make 50 potions, cure 50 patients, pet your dog 50 times. There's something comforting in the inevitability of just playing and knowing that the achievements will come in due time. Again, providing the save doesn't corrupt. And finally, ultimately, I get to have friendships and relationships reduced to swapping one line of dialogue per day and occasionally gifting them a bag of cloves. Only to, after the bar fills, be rewarded with sex or some other kind of enrichment. You know, gets me out of bed in the morning. Okay, so next we have Potion Permit. Potion Permit I'm kind of on the fence about because there are better farming simulator things, there's better cozy games out there, but it's also quite unique in regards to like the Tetris cauldron stuff. So I would say overall the mechanics are pretty good. The story is fine, the graphics are okay, it could do with a little bit more. What that is? I couldn't tell you. I think for a, a game that dabbles so much in like fantasy, it could stand to look a little bit more fantasy. I would have loved to see like a different colour palette or um, some different architecture beyond like the basic Harvest Moon stuff. I would give this game a 5 out of 10. It is literally fine. Okay, so the next comment on the comment showcase is fantastic. It's one of my favourites. And so this comment read, Dude, what are you talking about? The second season was my favourite season. Just because you didn't enjoy it doesn't mean you have to call it the worst season. It was amazing to play and interesting. It was very good. Even if you didn't enjoy it, then just move on. This isn't a review. This is just you wanting to try and trash something. You're overreacting. Saying that you're tortured by playing it? Just don't play it. Nobody is forcing you. Sorry, I'm unsubscribing. So this is one of my favourite comments of all time because this absolute temper tantrum wherein I am accused of overreacting was posted less than a minute after the 45 minute video in question it was posted on went live. Like this was the first comment on my Walking Dead season two video. It was posted before all of the people that come on and just type first. This kid saw the notification or maybe just had it flash up on his homepage and was so upset that he came and spent probably a minute typing this, meaning it was literally the second it went live that he even clicked on it in the first place. This was one of the most extreme knee-jerk explosions of childish behaviour I've ever seen. It was just such a pleasure to read and I really hope you enjoy it because I loved this. Some of you might be gutted to hear that I hated this game. I hated it. Having adored Resident Evil 7, 8, 3 Remake, 4 and 5, I came to this game very excited indeed to give it a shot, and while well, I couldn't fucking stand it. I gave this game a try on stream and I think my mounting frustration and disappointment was simultaneously palpable and annoying to watch, especially for established fans of the series. Games always have peaks and troughs, quiet moments, bits of filler, moments of action, moments of tension, moments of characterization, moments of frustration and disaster but for me, this game never really seemed to reach any kind of upward spike. Sure, it had downward spikes, all games do, but there was never any enjoyment to counteract that, so my experience was a hard negative. Let's talk about why. So the first grievance I discovered with this game is Mr. X. As the proudest and saddest crybaby piss boy who's ever touched the sticks, I can firmly say that as soon as this guy arrived on scene, I was not scared of him. Knowing that he spawns at some point, I was terrified. I crept around that police station crippled with fear. I had to take breaks. The tension of knowing Mr. X might arrive and scare the shit out of me was so overwhelming, and when he did arrive, my terror very quickly turned to irritation. He is so annoying. Mr. X chases you around the police station with this stony titan face and this fucking like trench coat and hat, and when he gets near you, he just punches you. I don't know, Nemesis in the 3 remake had me squealing with panic. Mr. X just had me annoyed. I don't think he ever killed me once, he just wound me up. And 
you know the worst part of critiquing his implementation? The snarky fuckhead in chat who hit me with, um, he's supposed to be annoying? So if he's annoying, then it's actually working exactly as intended, and it's extremely clever, and you cannot criticise it. Fuck off. I hate that argument. I hugely doubt that the writers of this game slapped the word irritating on a whiteboard and circled it 18 times in front of a room of enthralled designers. Let's make this so irritating that your player audibly rolls their eyes whenever he shows up, they said, nodding solemnly between themselves. Let's make him so irritating that players would rather deal with Overwatch solo queue instead. Mr. X was annoying, giving me that weird feeling somewhere between like boredom and I don't know. You know that feeling where you just don't give a shit? Well done, Mr. X, roaming around in your thumping heavy cleats. Long dead the terror of a roaming Jack Baker. And I suppose Mr. X highlights another grievance I have with this game. It never seems to find a good pace. For what it is, which is shit, the police station section is the highlight of the story, narratively, gameplay wise and puzzle wise. From this, depending on whether you play Leon or Claire, you'll go to the sewers or the orphanage respectively. The first being a bit of a boring maze and the second being a glorified cutscene. Then it's the sewers proper for both of them, which is, if anything, a grey bridge between the start and end of the game. Already we go from finding three clock emblems to be placed within the clock emblem thing, opening valves and closing grates. It's shit. Then we go to the lab, which feels like a mid-game area with Mr. X at the end as what feels like an early game boss. Like the Northern Asylum demon except with less batty to get lost in. Mr. X has a few phases, sure, but he just feels like filler. He's so boring and then the game ends. Sure, if you get the special ending or whatever it is, you get a train boss, but that just feels like a mid-game boss. Fuck it, you can't win with me, I swear. But the biggest thing in this game that got my goat is the combat. So in Resident Evil 2, the combat is intended to be a last resort. I get that, that makes sense to me. You kite and avoid enemies and bait them into attacking you so that you can suddenly pull off a sick dodge and dip around them. But so many zombies in the game just ignore that. So I might approach a zombie in a small corridor, at which point I'll faint to the left until they lunge at me, which traps them in a lunging animation. At this point I would suddenly spin back and quickly try and go around to the right while they were lunging towards the left wall. At that point they would spin 180 degrees on their heels in a single frame and suddenly just be grabbing me out of nowhere. On easy difficulties it wasn't an issue, but on hardcore mode this drove me into oblivion, gritting my teeth so hard my gums bled. These issues were majorly exacerbated in the 5th Survivor DLC, which has you on some Ethan must die gauntlet through the police station, during which I swear I could have killed a man with the sheer grip of rage I had on my controller. Bastard mode, stupid shit, couldn't bear it, and that sheriff thing in the gas station, Christ, I blacked out during that and woke up with a mouthful of blood. With the annoying combat, the underwhelming pace gameplay wise visually and narratively, it just never felt like a complete game. It felt like the foundations of a game, it felt like the skeleton of something fun, with all the little natural bits of frustration involved in playing a game, but with no actual meat on the bones. Like imagine if you played Resident Evil 7 except it's just six hours of the boat and the salt mines ending in the Eevee boss. Not a second of that game stood out to me, nothing whatsoever was memorable beyond annoyance. The Doll Girl DLC was alright though, I'll give it that. I fucking hated this game. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Especially if I was going to recommend a Resident Evil game to people, I would recommend every game before this, even Resident Evil 3 Remake. The mechanics were okay, frustrating, I mean the review said it better than I could. The graphics were brilliant, honestly, really stunning graphics, they looked incredible. Almost real in some, in some like, environments. The story was okay. I would give this a 3 out of 10. Okay, so this comment came with a little bit of my own foot in my mouth, but I hope you can forgive me for this one. So this commenter said, Okay, I understand that this video is months old and this comment probably won't be seen, but when you're talking about what your idea of a paedophile is, as a person lurking in the darkness and such, you go on to say a witch in her cottage. That is truly and disgustingly offensive on every level. As one who describes myself as a witch being a correct description of someone of the Wiccan faith, to imply that we are paedophiles? Is this a case of one bad apple ruining the bunch? Or do you just not know what an actual which is. I'm sure there are people of the Wiccan faith who are paedophiles, but I'm equally sure there are Christian and Catholic and atheist and Jewish and so on paedophiles. Did they enter your consideration as to paedophilia or just witches? Not all witches live in cottages, brewing evil potions and casting hexes. Though that is probably done by someone somewhere, it's not okay to push stereotypes and it's even worse to try and add something so disgusting and malevolent to a stereotype. So as you can see I put my foot in my mouth pretty hard with this one because I thought it was a copy pasta and I replied with that absolutely needlessly blasé turnaround. Whoops. Uh, so I 
I'm an atheist, I have no theological inclinations, although I did go to a Catholic primary school, and believe me when I say I am well aware that if there's any theology associated with the grooming of children, it is certainly not Wiccans. The point I made in the video was that children tend to get fed mythical evil during their vulnerable years. You're not taught to keep an eye out for an overfriendly PE teacher, or a handsy babysitter, or an aggressive and manipulative older friend or family member. Children tend to be taught that villains will be obvious when you see them. Think like Maleficent, Hades from Hercules, although that guy's great, I love him. Think um, the witch from Hansel and Gretel, think Frankenstein. So when I referenced the witch in her cottage, I was referring to that mythologized Hansel and Gretel style gingerbread cottage where you can see that she's bad. You don't need to listen to her and understand what she's asking you to, to know that she's bad. And it means that when children face real life evil, you don't always know until it's too late. So apologies if that was murky. I wasn't trying to accuse anybody of being a paedophile. I was more talking about like mythologized evil and how children don't tend to get taught about what they really need to look out for. Have you ever played something so perfectly assembled that it had to be brilliant, but actually ended up just being kind of boring? Carrion's like that to me. Carrion is a 2D game considered Metroidvania by some, and absolutely not Metroidvania by others, but I can't personally judge as I've never actually played such games myself. Either way, it's 2D, pixely, and involves you moving around a series of tunnels and caves, acquiring abilities that you can use to backtrack and unlock areas you've not had access to before, either to access literally the rest of the story, or just some collectibles and secrets. The art design is absolutely impeccable here. Everything is very neatly put together. You, big lumping meat monster that you are, throbs and writhes and slops around with the full weight of masses of gurgling, screaming bodies that you consume, able to drop and collect biomass like it's a McDonald's breakfast. The object of the game is to escape, but to do that you need to obtain abilities that you can use in different sizes, and to grow to different sizes you need to eat and kill humans, obviously. Some humans are defenseless, some of them have basic pistols, and some of them have electric shields and assault weapons that can burn you down in about three seconds. Some are in these crazy bipedal machines that mow you down and you have to rattle their tops off before they shred you. There's even a story, one that's detailed enough to actually be considered a story, but vague enough that it's arguably very open-ended. Throughout the game there are flashback sequences where you follow some suited bloke into the bowels of the earth, where by my assumptions he encounters you for the first time, this long-forgotten eldritch horror hibernating deep below the earth's crust. I know he touches you at some point and later in the game you can do something interesting with the DNA I presume you scrape from him like a q-tip, but god knows. The game has no dialogue, which keeps shit plenty vague, but we can pretty comfortably assume you got snatched up and buried in some top secret lab somewhere for observation and experimentation, which is probably why you're so furiously angry. That does lead me onto something. See, despite your cosmically deadly nature, and how dangerous the game frames you as, you are very easy to kill. The later levels need to be played with spoonfuls of care, which creates a, and I finally get to use this term in a real context I'm so excited, Ludo narrative dissonance, where the narrative tells us that we are a super scary, dangerous monster that absolutely cannot reach the surface for the sake of humanity, needing to be imprisoned miles below the earth's crust, away from anyone and everyone, and a gameplay sequence where we die at the merest mention of visiting in-laws. From this I started to gather from the game that I wasn't playing it properly. Something about it always felt like it was calling me an idiot, but I was never punished enough for being an idiot that I learned or adapted, so I just carried on. Save points are always close by, and I would often brute force my way through rooms, saving after every kill, only to finally enter the room and find an intricate network of vents and objects I was supposed to use to stealthily remove every enemy, and I would be like, damn, I was supposed to use this? God, I'm stupid. Then I'd never learn from it and just do the same thing every time. Every time walking into a room like, oh wow, I am a moron. Every time unthinkingly brooting my way through the next room. Every time tumbling through this desperate, lost, unblinking cycle of madness. As you venture through the story, these routes become less and less tenable anyway. There are three sizes your character- character, maybe? Character? Are you character? Uh, yeah, well, three sizes your character can become, and you gain the ability to be these sizes at certain points in the story. You start as mini, you can be normal size, and then you can be humongous. Each will have entirely different abilities mapped to the controls, which sounds confusing, but weirdly it's fine when you start to know which side you need to be. You're never softlocked, which I think is a beautiful detail of design. Different forms have different abilities too, so you have to shift 
shift mass around and leave it in places and pick it up again between puzzle steps, which is fairly clever and adds depth to all the sequences. I like this mechanic, it felt unique and added complexity. Once you become humongous, moving around is a pain in the arse. Your centre of gravity is just that, quite central, and the bigger you are, the more unwieldy it is to move around, which is probably intentional to counter the usefulness of being big, but at that size it takes like seven attempts just to get into a vent, it just felt like an imbecile. Speaking of, the movement in this game is weird. I thought maybe it's because it's made for PC, but my friend Bluebird played it on PC and they had even more of a nightmare. You move with the left stick and change directions and aim with the right stick, which sounds very simple but ends up getting confused in my head. My fingers will do whatever and sometimes they'll get it right and sometimes they won't. It's one of those moments where you're looking at the screen and wondering why it's not working and then you look down at your hands and you're not even holding the controller, you're just holding a toaster and standing by the bath wondering why you can taste blood between your teeth again. Okay, so Carrion. Wait, Carrion's weird, because I wouldn't recommend it. Despite the fact that the mechanics are good, the story is fine, and the graphics are brilliant, I just wouldn't recommend it. I can't think of anybody I know who would like it, and I personally didn't get that much of enjoyment out of it, so I would probably give this one a 4 out of 10. Okay, so the next comment on the comment showcase said, It is so refreshing to find a fellow true gamer who is a female. There are just so many girls these days who pretend to be enormous video game fangirls. Personally, I'm an only child and grew up very poor. My mum couldn't afford a babysitter 80% of the time, so instead she saved up to get me video games and I would walk home beginning age 7 and just play games for the rest of the night until she finally got off work around 8pm. Nurses work horrid hours, it's really sad honestly. But yeah, games basically raised me. To me, they are an inter interactive form of art that is a beautiful, incredibly unique method of storytelling. I'm sorry for going off on a rant, my point just is I can tell you were a true gamer. You aren't a poser who makes these videos, streams online, pushing up your tits and begging for money, claiming you are a gamer girl, like so many of our gender on here. I can tell you truly love video games and that is freaking awesome, keep up the great work. So this comment was really well meaning, but I did have to speak to them about demonising other women, which felt very ungrateful, but if they don't hear it from me then who are they going to hear it from? Gaming is a really easy hobby but it requires a lot of upfront investment and a lot of time, especially if you play competitive games with a team, otherwise you just sat in a room for hours playing single player games and I don't think it's possible to fake this hobby in that case. You know, don't separate women into real and fake and then gatekeep the fake ones because A, there's nothing to stop other people from doing it to you in the future and if you contribute to it then you're only making it more ingrained and B, it's obviously done out of jealousy and insecurity and you have much more worthwhile things to do with your time than bank your identity on being insecure. Like this person literally literally introduce themselves to me as somebody who isn't like the other girls. That's their identity. That's how they carry themselves. Like, I used to be like this when I was a teenager. I can completely understand where it comes from. Just try and resist the urge and try and just build a little bit more security within yourself because it will be worth it in the long run. Does anybody remember this piece of shit? Because I do. I loved Far Cry 5, as many of you will know, and while I wasn't sure on the concept of Far Cry 6, I thought, hey, you were surprised with how much you loved 5, maybe you'll love 6, so I gave it a go. And oh my god, it was something real special. Far Cry 6 takes the fun that was Far Cry 5, the fluid combat, the easy gunplay, the satisfying gameplay, and just bogs it down with friction. You need different bullets for everything. Cars are realistically so hard to find that you have to sprint for kilometres at a time before you find something you can drive. Enemy aggro range is stickier than the other side of your brother's duvet. There were very occasional points during the game where I found myself really enjoying it. This is alright, I would think, surprised, my goldfish brain forgetting the past 8 hours of misery, suddenly fixated on the fun I was actually having. Maybe I'll do the PS4 trophy list as well when I'm done here. Maybe that'll be fun, I thought. But then I would stop what I was doing, be that driving or fighting or whatever, because my measly ammo rations had entirely depleted and there was literally nothing nearby to replenish them, so I was just punching the enemies to death or trying to run and find more ammo or using that flimsy flamethrower thing you get. But then I realised that these things were just the echoes of Far Cry 5, still clinging to the back of this, the races, the driving, the spec ops missions, at lower levels of course. At higher levels they're balanced for multiplayer, but it's not even been a year and the servers are completely dead, so you end up having to struggle through them by yourself while they're balanced for two people unless you can find some unwitting fool who's willing to help. I probably enjoyed about 20% of my experience with this game, which for a 70 hour game is 
quite a significant thing to say, and that 20% was the gutted corpse of Far Cry 5, upon which this disgusting foundation had been built. The animal companions were just Far Cry 5. The fluidity and variety of the gunplay was just Far Cry 5. The character customization was just Far Cry 5. The races, the side quests, the stealth. Maybe it was actually Far Cry 4, but I didn't play that one. For every fun quest or interesting mechanic, there were five new gameplay impediments that unapologetically put up barriers to having fun. I love flying around in helicopters and planes, especially to get around the map, just like in 5, but oh no, now they've added anti-aircraft missiles that shoot you down if you don't arbitrarily clear the several that squat in each region. Oh, I can't use my favourite method of travel? Okay, I'll just fast travel to the mission instead. Oh, even if you've unlocked that fast travel point, you can't fast travel to a location near an active mission. Oh, okay, well, my closest fast travel point is 5 kilometres away. Oh, I can't fast travel to this new point anyway because a helicopter a football field away has noticed me and aggroed, and my Supremo needs 10 minutes to recharge before I can shoot this helicopter out of the sky. I am completely out of all other ammo. Bug snacks let me fast travel when in combat, Ubisoft. Maybe take a leaf out of their book. Ah, oh, well, anyway, I guess I'm in for a commute then, sprinting until I maybe find a car or a horse, watching my character become out of breath every 15 seconds. God, this is the life. I fucking hate this. This is like using a park and ride, except even more miserable than being sat on a Trent Barton bus, watching the grubby neighbourhood of Lenton slither past me until I accidentally drive over some road spikes and have to find another vehicle again. I finally reach a settlement. It needs to be upgraded. It needs 800 gasoline to be upgraded. I look in my inventory. I have 210. I sit on the floor and I cry. Why is it so miserable? Why is it like pulling teeth? I'm beyond outraged. I've not even talked about the game itself yet. In usual Ubisoft pussy fashion, yeah you heard me, they've taken a political backdrop for a political location and tried to dumb it down as hard as possible. So it's apolitical for the gamers. We're basically playing some kind of Cuban revolution, but this isn't Cuba, this is actually Yara, and we're leading some revolution, or we're part of some revolution. I didn't know and I didn't care. And the cast of characters I was burdened with absolutely kept me from caring for even a moment. Some of them were okay, but there were some singer people that were fucking annoying. Beyond annoying. Man, Joseph Seed was compelling. Jacob and John and whatever the woman was called, they were compelling. I wanted to know everything about them. I pored over notes and watched their cutscenes with great interest. This guy, this supposed antagonist, he was just Chicken Man from Breaking Bad. I can't even remember his name in this, so I just called him Gus Fring the entire time, since that was clearly the script he was given. Just being like Gus Fring, I could hear the director say, just do the bit where he smiles and then looks really angry all of a sudden. You know the bit. The side quests in this game can vary wildly in interest and engagement, that's whatever, but the main quests? Oh my god, the main quests. The main quests demonstrated to me the absolute lengths this design team will go to in order to take a survive for five minutes concept and stretch it out across 30 fucking hours. I hate these kinds of missions because there's no structure to them. You get to a meeting point or you find something that your buggy NPC friend needs to fix or whatever, and they go, fuck, the Yorans are onto us. Keep them busy while I do this. And then a little bar starts filling up one crumb at a time and you know you have 15 minutes ahead of you of just killing enemies that spawn until the game decides to let you go forward again. It's just lazy. It just takes missions that would be super short otherwise and arbitrarily lengthens them. It means you don't have to structure a mission, provide clever enemy spawns or different methods of traversing the area. It means you don't have to provide structured dialogue or steps. You don't have to make sure everything's there waiting for the player at the end. You don't need to create puzzles. You just litter an area with enemy spawns and set a timer for 12 minutes over and over and over again for 70 fucking hours. As usual, Ubisoft hopped on the bandwagon with a live service of a game that was a pain in the ass to play and while not especially fantastic also, it's easily outclassed by so many other games. Unless you were particularly poised to enjoy something like this, I don't know why you wouldn't just play something better. 80 gigabytes of real special at this point you're just selling me legal malware. I really like the DLCs though, they were good. Especially watching Vars try and fuck his sister. That was the character exploration I didn't know I needed. Thanks Ubisoft. Far Cry 6. I would never recommend this to anybody. I would recommend this to somebody that I hated. I would be like, I want this person to waste time and money, I will recommend it to them, but to most people I would not recommend. The mechanics were bad. Anything good about the game mechanically had been brought forward from Far Cry 5 and potentially Far Cry 4. The graphics were brilliant, but you know, you polish a turd and it's still a turd. The story was shit. I was really unengaged. The only thing I cared about was Diego, which was the main, uh, the main villain's son. I can't really give any spoilers, but that doesn't pan out in a way that I found particularly productive. So I would give this game a 2 out of 10. I thought that it was dog shit.
Okay, so this completely unhinged comment on the comment showcase said, The second you said you don't like Bloodborne because it plays like shit, I unsubscribed, disliked all your videos, and disregarded everything you said because clearly you don't know what the fuck you were talking about. So, this comment kind of left me speechless. I think if you're the kind of person who enacts what you consider to be performative, actualized justice against a stranger online because they have a different opinion than you, then there will be a point where I'm reading about it when the police publish the note you leave before you drive a van through a pride parade. I think Bloodborne plays like shit, sure, it's capped at 30 fps which i can't visually tell the difference between but i feel the difference when my inputs get eaten and despite how free-flowing the game looks it to me feels very clunky and slow but it's got the best story out of any fromsoft game the visual design is absolutely insane and oh yeah i named my cat yosefka that's what sefi is short for not sephiroth her name is yosefka on her vet forms her name is yosefka the imposter like she's the second yosefka but yeah anyway i'm sure i'll see this person featured in a stephanie harlow video one day you know hopefully i won't be the victim but yeah, if you're this kind of person, then just seek help. I don't know what to tell you. Longtime fans of the channel will know that the Remnant from the Ashes video was one of my worst backlashes ever for a channel that had like 28 subs. Long live the day when someone called me a little boy and told me to come back to reviewing videos when my balls drop. I got told to fuck off a lot, like proportionally. Fans of Remnant are beyond unhinged. But one single actual human being in the comment actually was a really good laugh and in their infinite generosity suggested I try Kronos before the Ashes, which was Remnant's predecessor. It took me a while, like a year and a half, but I I gave it a go and it's definitely all right. The weirdest thing about Kronos was that it was originally made for VR, not ported as a simple non-VR game until several years later, but why? The game is played in third person. I wondered if the game originally played in first person, but going back and checking gameplay, the game was always in third person, even back when it was just on VR. That must be so weird to play, and forcing you to buy a VR headset just to play it is definitely one of the highest prices of entry I've ever seen. It definitely seemed to work best in third person with a basic controller, how I played it, but who knows, maybe it's secretly a 10 out of 10 in VR. Chronos Before the Ashes is essentially a more stripped back remnant, which is exactly what you'd expect for a game that was made before Remnant, like literally. This game is the foundation upon which Remnant was built, the most surprising detail of that being that the game is played entirely in melee, swords, axes, etc, being that melee was, for me, the worst part of Remnant and something I avoided entirely unless I was completely out of ammo. Upgrades are very simple, it's not an upgrade tree as much as it is an upgrade road. One linear pathway, incremental numbers of shards to upgrade once, upgrading causes damage to increase, extremely simple, which for someone who despises learning intricate systems with lots of branching pathways, ahem, Monster Hunter World worked just fine for me. The combat in Kronos is extremely simple, you have one or two attacks and stringing attacks together forms simple combos. As you play through the game you unlock four different chargeable abilities called Dragon Stones or Dragon Hearts or something, I can't remember. One sets your sword ablaze, one shocks enemies, one acts as lifesteal, and one gives you a shield. These weren't mechanics I really engaged with on my first playthrough, which was on easy, but on heroic difficulty they absolutely make or break your experience, which I will get to, I assure you. Beyond that you can block and parry, dodge roll, etc. The animations are extremely stiff. For example, healing, which has your character stop moving, put their weapon away, reach into their back pocket, pull out a heal, hold it in front of them, activate the heal, then put it back into their pocket again, then take their weapon out again. Your health doesn't just blip back up to max either. It recharges over a few seconds, and if you get hit at any point during that, it cancels the animation and the heal, and you have to try again. See, the trick about this game is that the combat is very slow. Most of the enemies have a few basic attacks with some absurdly telegraphed wind-ups, and their larger attacks have some laughable cooldowns, so you actually have more than enough time to pull off ridiculous heals like this. And it is one of those games where combat feels like it could be faster, but it's not. When you play this, you have to learn to slow down and play at the game speed, or you're going to tilt so hard that you cry. And that does involve a lot of patience. There are five levels in this game. Some big stone castle belonging to a population called the Krell. Some expansive web of tree houses home to some goat looking bipeds called the Pan. Then a massive crumbling labyrinth suspended in space. Then Ward 13, which is where most of the context and story lives. And the final boss themselves. Oh, that's four levels. Never mind. The architecture is revisited in Remnant with slightly more story layered on top. So it's nice to go back and visit all these places again in their infancy. Every level feels like a 
a significant step up difficulty wise from the last, but you level up so quickly just from killing basic enemies at the start that you soon balance out. No matter the difficulty, there's no way you reach that isn't surmountable after about 10 minutes of power leveling effort and a few ability boosting death. Everything is sufficiently balanced and the game can easily be finished within 8 hours, so it's a worthwhile journey to embark on. Speaking of deaths however, this game has a very unique aging mechanic that this team absolutely whimped out on and I am so disappointed in them. So in Kronos, before the ashes, every time you die your character ages 1 year. They start the game aged 18 and the maximum age you can reach is 90. That's 72 deaths you are permitted by this game over the course of an 8 hour experience. That's a lot of deaths that, unless you're challenge running heroic mode on your very first playthrough, you're not going to need to worry about. Age is separate from your level, but the two do impact each other. As you grow your stat boosts per character level per change, for example at younger ages your character will have higher strength, but when they get older they'll gain arcane boosts instead. Every 10 deaths you get a permanent ability to add to your build. Higher arcane defense, faster heals, more base health etc, and on heroic difficulty these can really turn a tide, especially against the final boss who hits like a truck and has one of the worst fire breathing hitboxes I've ever seen, often one shotting me when I was stood at his shoulder or off to the side. I think any space in front of his face counts as a death box or something because I was feeding and tilting and feeding and tilting. So as I died and died and died and died and began to veer worryingly close to level 90, my anxiety started to creep in. Will there be one mega ability waiting for me at age 90 and from then on if I die again, do I die forever? Like an 8 hour game with 70 lives is pretty fair, from then on it's a one life run, permadeath right, but with my cards stacked as well as they can be in my favour. When I died again to that horrible final boss I just respawned but I hadn't aged. That's right, once you get to level 90 the aging mechanic just stops, you stay at that level forever. Chronos Before the Ashes is a fun game, it's well packaged, pretty tightly constructed game with good level design, a sufficient UI and in-game guidance, and some of the most cowardly designers I've ever encountered. Patch in permadeath you frauds, let me live my misery. I would probably not recommend this game, but only because Remnant from the Ashes exists. I think Remnant from the Ashes is better if you can make it work. My friends uh, Cranky and Jim Jam played Remnant from the Ashes in co-op together on PC and they had a completely bug-free experience, or a more or less bug-free experience. They had like no bugs whatsoever. They had a really chill time with it. I played it and I had so many bugs that aspects of it were unplayable, some trophies were broken between patches. On my Remnant from the Ashes review, if you ever decide to go and watch it, there's I, I put a montage of all the bugs I got in the review near the end so you can, I think it was a four hour stream that I did with two of my friends and I had like a five or six minute montage of the more interesting bugs alone. The ones that you could actually see on screen are the ones that actually made sense outside of context. So for me Remnant from the Ashes was a mess but I would probably recommend it over Kronos only because it's basically it's basically a more developed Kronos which is exactly what you want from a sequel in my opinion. The mechanics were serviceable, the graphics were like stylized but unrefined you know they were they're that kind of like timeless graphic but even then something about them just wasn't quite there. And the story was fine so I'd give this game a 4 out of 10. Not a malicious 4 out of 10, just a, it's been done better since by the same people kind of 4 out of 10. So the next comment on the comment showcase was a brilliant accidental self-tell. So this person said, why are western women so evil and victimised so much towards romance? Like you see every romantic interaction as creepy or a rape attempt. So this one highlighted to me a fantastic lack of self-awareness. If you attempt 10 romantic interactions with women and one of them finds it a bit creepy, then it's probably safe to say you just misstepped a bit, came off a bit strong, maybe weirded her out, you definitely aren't that compatible, maybe she misinterpreted it, but it's a one-off and it's all good. If you attempt a romantic interactions with 10 women and all of them think it's creepy or god forbid a rape attempt then there's probably a certain degree of reflection you need to engage in. The situation this commenter is talking about is the trope in movies where the guy basically just harasses the female protagonist with love until she suddenly loves him back which is a far cry from the vast majority of real life you know no means no. As someone who hates jump scares, cheesy horror movies and cutie heavy gameplay, you can bet I gave this game a miss. I would wrinkle my nose at it, it's just an 8 hour film I'd sneer, that's not gameplay, it's a choose your own adventure novel. But really I think I was just quite scared of it. See, I don't like jump scares and as you'll know, after even a cursory glance at this game, it is nothing but jump scares. They're hit and miss, some of them are so telegraphed, the circumstances of a situation so twisted together to manufacture it, that you see it coming a mile away and it washes off you like rain. Some of them, god, I don't show jump 
jump scares in my videos so all I'll say is the clown one or the zombie if that's what you picked. Walking over to pick up a totem I got hit so hard that I screamed my lungs to shreds. That was a nasty nasty little jump scare. Some jump scares I feel I can quite respect when they're done well. Usually with careful level design and character positioning the game will put you in a room and you'll walk over to investigate something on the left like a visual draw getting you nervous wondering what it is and then something will suddenly drop in front of you or from the right and you'll shoot through the roof propelled by a trail of shit that is ejected hard from your back end. Silent Hill 3 has one like that if you remember it you know but then you get cowardly ones where things will just pop up on screen with no rhyme or reason. The dog in the asylum is one such jump scare you're walking up some stairs when suddenly the screen cuts to said dog which barks loudly with a noise sting to make you really jump and it just feels trite like it feels cheap. Until Dawn combines cheap and trite jump scares with actual good ones which I feel kind of works. The cheap jump scares become drum beats to keep pace between the proper ones that clang in your memory like symbols. They become another medium through which to raise tension. I enjoyed their use both in emphasising the story's horror movie parody but also in building real tangible horror. Needless to say but Until Dawn severely tested my blood pressure. So Until Dawn is one of those games that markets themselves on branching paths and choices having impact which like with all similar games is often just a different layer of paint on the ending cutscene. Sure characters can die at various forks in the story but characters that can die often cease to be of any use after the moment of their possible death. Besides a few expendable moments that simply cease to happen if they are dead, the characters will mainly just go silent for the rest of the story or only do things away from the main cast like leave to investigate a noise or have private conversations away from the team. I think a measure of quality in that regard is not whether or not a game has them but how well a game hides them and in Until Dawn's defence it hides them very well. You can comfortably have a full playthrough without noticing all the moments otherwise deceased characters should have had an impact on the story. And I think what works so well is the story indeed. The story is really good. It's not some flimsy narrative with vague plot intentions and lots of obviously manufactured conflict to keep the pacing staggering forwards like say The Walking Dead Season 2 where every episode needs to feel like the audience is getting their money's worth. The story is intensely interesting and appropriately paced. Every chapter is compelling. Wendigos aren't often used in media unless you're a Stephen King fan so learning about them here in depth was a first time phenomenon for me. I feel like when the monster in a game is a zombie or a ghost or some shit you know the rules about them comfortably without needing them explained but at least for me Wendigos were new enough that I was soaking up all the context with interest. Especially their vision being based on movement which was a brilliant detail that worked so well with some of the game's few mechanics. You know that final fight or more like standoff in the house was extremely tense. I loved it. It shows that every final fight doesn't need to be a fight. There are different ways to have a climax to a story that can work really well. And what I also loved about this game was that they weren't afraid to make characters we wouldn't necessarily like. This not only allowed their good attributes to shine through and gave many of the characters, especially Matt, some very solid and satisfying character arcs, but also gave us a reason to question our own morality. I wonder how many people shot Emily in the face because she was a bit of a bitch, having literally committed no crimes beyond being rude to others and very impulsive, like a selfish and spiteful teenager like she is. I like, as with Emily's case, they did lean really hard into making her comically bitchy at points, but whatever, you know, it served a purpose. This game is one of those games that walks a very, very thin line between being a game or being a choose your own adventure DVD, like my old copy of Final Destination 3 where you'd get a little on screen binary choice like go through the door or don't go through the door, and you could try and save the characters by making them do other things and entirely different scenes would play out, all carefully made and recorded just for the DVD release. God, those were the days. A lot of people simply don't consider these games, and I do understand, especially with Until Dawn, since it is hugely based on cheesy horror flicks, but for what it's worth, I think they're games. They have gameplay, fail states, choices, mechanics, they're just very on rails, which means that while there are branching paths you can trial each playthrough, you're seldom going to have situations that you can try in different ways or map differently or route differently. The experience will unfortunately almost always be the same. Until Dawn is a game that I would recommend. A lot of people don't consider its gameplay to be gameplay, and I think I mentioned it in the review, but I do. I think it's literally what a game is. It's a bit sparse on the gameplay, but I think it's still a game. The mechanics are below average, but the graphics are good, and the story I think is fantastic. So, 7 out of 10. Okay, so this comment showcase came from my video on The Last of Us 2, which as many of you will know I didn't like, but this person said, I liked Lev as a character. The only issue I had is that in this world where civilization has collapsed, even if someone had gender dysmorphia, I doubt that they would be able to put a finger on why they don't feel normal, as one wouldn't quite have had the time to dwell on it when they and everybody else are actually struggling to survive day to day, meal to meal. All the progress we had made in understanding that affliction would be all but lost, and to me it felt as if it were there not to examine it properly or to say anything meaningful, but 
but simply to be a self-congratulatory and critic proof of the game, as most mainstream critics these days will overlook everything and heap praise upon a game or movie if they perceive it as being in political alignment with them. Essentially it felt like modern political strutting where modern politics shouldn't exist as it does now, but other than that, Lev wasn't badly written, but his place in that universe didn't feel natural in its portrayal, at least to me. First of all, my politics pretty much align with The Last of Us 2 and I think it's dog shit. But secondly, I absolutely love the degree of nitpicking that starts to arise when people are people 20 years after an apocalypse, living fairly stable lives. Like, Lev is so busy living on an island that he can't possibly know himself to a degree enough to know that he is a man, especially living with the extremist mad Christian cult because it's always an extremist mad Christian cult. It would have taken Lev a long time to work up to his coming out as a man and beginning a social transition, especially when like threatened with death and exile. Like, it's not a choice that you would take just randomly, but you just get people coming in like, um, being trans takes time and effort and resources and without the driving force of modern technology there is simply no way that Lev could be trans, like it's some kind of niche lifestyle choice, like driving a fucking Ford Punto. Same when people whinge about Abby having muscles after what, four years of working out, her bedroom's next to a gym, she has three square meals a day, she's not that ripped for someone who's been working out for four years. Like, I didn't like this game at all and there are plenty of reasons to dislike the game in my opinion, but nitpicking the existence of trans people and muscular people just makes it seem to the observer like you don't ever really meet people in real life. And I do love how these people become like experts on what it means to be trans the second it's in a video game. Like you've, I, I, yeah, you know what I mean. God. Hello, it's my birthday, and since it's my special day, we will be talking about some of my favourite games. We're talking about Cook Serve Delicious 2 and 3. This is a little series you might not have heard of due to its gameplay nicheness, but it's actually one of, if not my favourite gaming series of all time. I love this series so much that I wrote the guides for both games. I've gotten the plat on the EU and North America stacks of both 2 and 3. I've not played one since it's either not on PSN or it doesn't have a trophy list, I can't remember, but Cook Serve Delicious is fucking fantastic and proof that the simplest formulas can be refined to perfection. You see, Cook Serve Delicious doesn't go for breadth, it goes for depth. Rather than introducing you to loads of mechanics, loads of gameplay, it has one premise. You cook food to order and serve it in time. There's no walking around, no free roam, just day after day of cooking. You can upgrade your facilities to a certain extent, but it's about mastering a few things, not generally excelling at loads of different things. You know, from that, it's anyone's game. The game always starts very simply. In Cook Serve Delicious 2, you have a certain amount of restaurants each with like up to 30 different days you can play. Those restaurants will be themed and each day will have a strict menu that's pre-decided by the game itself. You only have a few unlocked at the beginning and you need to earn medals in those restaurants to unlock more restaurants. The restaurants you unlock become more and more complex as you play but you have to earn them, meaning you're not just going to get access to them until you've proven you can do them. These games are mechanically paced so well, you grow alongside the complexity. In Cooks of Delicious 3 you are in a food truck driving across a post-apocalyptic United States with the help of two robot assistants. I promise it makes sense, and while you do have routes and days, you are free to pick your own menus with a few caveats. Some days you might only be allowed to pick food that starts with B, or food that was in Cook Serve Delicious 2, or only Mexican food, etc. Some days customers will be frustrated so their orders time out faster. Some days customers will be angry and their orders will begin timing out as soon as they're put in. You have to adapt, and as you start to learn the recipes to the point of muscle memory perfection, you will be able to deliver some ridiculously complex dishes within seconds, and you often won't even notice. Sure, there will be difficulty spikes, certain days have some crazy expectations, but you can play other days and come back when you're ready or when your facilities are a little bit more upgraded, or you can just brute force it if you really can't move on until this demon has been slain. The good thing about this in Cook Serve Delicious 3 is that if you're brave, you can stack a menu with recipes you can comfortably make, but then sub in some things you've never made before, slowly building a comfortable repertoire of all the dishes in the game. You'll also discover dishes you never realised you'd enjoy making so much. Cook Serve Delicious 2 is good because each day it's structured specifically in a way that it might be challenging, but it is achievable and you will manage it. But Cook Serve Delicious 3 is good because you can take control enough to have an easy day or a hard day depending on your capacity for punishment. Sometimes you'll assemble a menu that's just impossible to do under constraints. You learn the hard way, you back out, you remake the menu. Easy, we learn. The art in this game is beautiful. Weirdly, my favourite art is the gelato, which is one of the simplest recipes. You can see the foundation gelato, the vanilla, and then every scoop has a different colour and texture. Something so 
simple and beautiful about that. I really liked it. It makes the food look way too nice. I really like cooking and I do my best with it, but damn, I'll never make a pork loin like that. Jesus. My mouth waters. This game makes me hungry. What I really like about Cook, Serve, Delicious 2 and 3 is that this kind of gameplay mechanic adds incomprehensible numbers of layers to the game. The premise, the foundation is right there at the bottom. It's solid and it works. And you can see yourself growing beyond that. Chili Bowl, a dessert themed restaurant in Cook, Serve, Delicious 2, filled me with frustration and terror when I first encountered it. Desserts are complex in Cook, Serve, Delicious, usually taking multiple steps, some of which, like waffle cones, need to be cooked and can burn. Some, like Thai shaved ice, have like three or four pages of unfamiliar names of ingredients to stack. Some, like pies, have two possible bases and then like a hundred fillings, and then different tops. But I got good at pie and now it's my favourite thing to make. I love pies, they're dependable, I always choose them, they're an easy four points on any menu, and they take ages to cook, so they take up space that could be occupied by other incoming recipes, which bottlenecks my orders, which means I have more time to focus on them. There's complexity and strategy to the game. When orders are moving fast, you leave cooked food out right up until the point where it's about to burn, just to jam up prep stations and stop more orders from coming in. You control the flow of food beyond just delivering it. Some levels are so hard that you have to, but it works. I was terrified of coffee and now I love making it. Same for smoothies. You get so brilliant at the easier foods that they just become boring to make after a while. You want to start subbing in harder foods for more challenge and enjoyment and save the easier foods for harder levels. This game is an exercise in mastery. You can't be a generalist at this game and last three rounds in Coffee Central, especially for some of the hardest trophies in the game, which require full days with no mistakes. You have to live and breathe coffee. Towards the end of my Cook Serve Delicious 2 play in particular, I was having dreams where that familiar list of recipes was sat along the left of my vision. I swear I was moving my hands in my sleep, pressing dream buttons, adding whip and cinnamon powder, then lid, then deliver. The little green faces would pop up. Definitely my most confusing wet dream, but you know, Pavlov works in mysterious ways. Also, Chubbigans, if you ever watch this, please name a trophy after me. I would sell my dad for the opportunity. I've asked him, he doesn't mind. He said he would help clean. I love you, Chubbs. Thanks for the games, you are a genius. Video. Uh, Cook Serve Delicious 2. Would I recommend this? Yes. The mechanics? Perfect. The graphics? Perfect. The story? Fine. 9 out of 10. I could not fault this game beyond surface level things, like the fact that I wasn't really that- I wasn't there for a story, so it kept showing me these cutscenes and stuff, and I was like, look, I'm not, not, not that bothered, but the thing is, like, it was a labour of love, the story, the characters and everything, so I was like, I can't, can't fault these, I'm just not here for them. So I ended up skipping a lot of them. I missed- when I was playing Cook, Serve, Delicious 3, I really missed the set menus of Cook, Serve, Delicious 2, but I also really appreciated the fact that some of the set menus on Cook, Serve, Delicious 2 were bollocks and really mean. So, you know, it's it's like give and take. I I'm never happy, basically, is, is what I'm trying to is what I'm trying to say. I went to the toilet and then realized I had forgotten to record the conclusion of the video. I've had a few drinks throughout the time I've been recording as well, so I've gotten progressively more and more wavy. But that's it. That's every five minute review since September. I hope you enjoyed them. Stay tuned for the next compilation video, which will be out in a few months. All pledge on Patreon to see them as they come out. Amongst many other pledge rewards, of course. Don't forget to like the video, drop a comment, agree, disagree, just generally sound off. What's your favourite? Amphibian. Uh, and subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!